DARPA wants a train on the moon. The last Delta IV Heavy is getting ready for its final launch, and we're already well on our way to Starship Flight 4. Welcome to this week's NSF Live. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Welcome again to another week of NSF Live. This is our weekly hangout slash new show. We've, if, if you have missed it in previous weeks, we've kind of tweaked the format a little bit, tweaked the day, tweaked the time, and yeah, we hope you're enjoying the new setup. But let's just jump right into it. We've got a lot to talk about this week. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF. You know me, the guy with the beard and the Bacon and the orange, you get it. Also joining us for today's show, as per usual, is EJ, who is smiling in a disconcerting way. EJ, how are you doing? Oh, hey. No, yeah, everything's good. Yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, my brother just came, dropped me off at the airport. How, how are you doing? Not the moon port? I mean, if it's a space shuttle, you know, you could land at an airport. All right, I'll allow it. <laughs> Speaking of the shuttle, we have Sawyer also on today's NSF Live. And you even have a little shuttle in the background. What's up, Sawyer? I do. It is a model, of course, of Endeavor. I want to start with a poem. There once was a man from Peru who dreamed he was eating his shoe. He awoke in the night with a terrible fright to find that his trains go choo-choo. What? <sighs> It'll make sense once we get into the topic, won't it? Yeah. Okay. We and were talking like... in the pre-show, if we're members, we were talking in the pre-show of how many times are we going to say choo-choo? So I'm starting us up strong with one choo-choo. All, right. All right, we got one down. Uh, Chad, I'm oh. counting on you to, uh, to keep track here of our choo-choo I choo promise choo it'll count. make sense. I promise. So, yeah, I mean, let's just jump right into it. Uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, is that what DARPA stands for? I think it is. Uh, has asked Northrop Grumman to study the feasibility of a train on the moon. The moon choo train, choo. baby, let's go. Choo choo, yeah. <laughs> is that, I'm on does that board. count as one or two choo choos? <laughs> That's two At least choo one. Choo. Okay, two. That's fine. All right, so we're up to three. We're up for those keeping count. We're up to three. <laughs> but yeah, I think this is this is a really nifty thing because I feel like the Venn diagram of space nerds and train nerds. Like, there's a significant crossover between the two. I like trains. I think we can all agree, car bad, train good. Um, I mean, car also okay, but mostly train good is the is the takeaway here. Uh, and, and this is a uh, this is pretty interesting. I I mean, obviously, there's a long road to go from like a feasibility study to an actual functioning train on the moon this is not saying there will be a train on the moon but it's pretty cool it's pretty cool to think about lunar infrastructure in general and and uh what the future of lunar activities could look like especially if we start getting into um, large-scale in-situ resource utilization i mean if we're going to want to turn the moon into a giant gas station for interplanetary vehicles, then we need infrastructure. 
So yeah, Moon Train. I, I mean, I don't. <laughs> I just want to run around shouting Moon Train because I'm so excited about this even being a possibility. But uh, I, I don't know, EJ. What is your? What was your? What was your reaction? What's your take on the old on the old Moon Train choo choo? Uh, um, that's for. Did Did you just say car bad? Car bad. Yes, car bad. Uh oh. Car hmm. bad. Train good. Hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Um, moon trains. I I like it. I think it's cool. I, I saw the contract and like it, it was in the morning, and I hadn't had coffee yet, and I was you know just scrolling <laughs> through social media as one does, and I was I scrolled by. I'm like, oh, hmm, Arthur Grumman Moon Train, and then I went, wait, 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 wait. What did that just say? And then I went and read the contract, the, the the press release, and I was like, huh, Moon Train. Didn't have that on the bingo card today, but. Did not. I'm here. No. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Sawyer, what about you? I, that was another one of those where you see the headline and go, "Okay, is this the onion?" It really felt like it was going to be an onion piece, and yet, <laughs> no. Turns out it's actually Northrop Grumman on their website. It's real. It's an idea, and I mean, I get it. But like, if you think of all the cool sci-fi shows, it's always like a point-to-point -point type deal going between locations, or. You take the long drive on a Louvre rover before some random monster attacks you in like Apollo 18 or something. But what? you never see any movie where it's like, you know what? Let's take the train between all of these different ones. I think Andy Weir may have had something similar to that, if I recall, going between domes in, um, oh, I forget which, the one that he had set on the moon, but... It's such a weird idea to think that the U.S. can't even build its own train network here, but we'll build trains on the moon. Hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. You say car bad, and you say we, st we stink at building trains? We don't stink at building trains. We stink, about, we stink at moving people around with trains. Okay, train that's, that, really that good. is, that that is a fair distinction. That tracks? Wow, mother. Sawyer. You melon wow. farmer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a good distinction, EJ. We are really yeah. good at rail freight, and we're really bad. We as in the U.S. at uh, humans on trains for some reason. But well, I mean, if you want, we can unpack train good, car bad. Like I'm I'm here for that. Like I, I'm not saying I don't like cars, but uh, but yeah, I mean maybe we maybe we f focus on the old moon train. Are they is now it, here? Uh, I got you. We can so. A train and a car are just avenues of transportation, all right? They're yes. a, a tool for logistics, for moving people or cargo around. With that being yes. said, every tool has its own purpose. There are times where trains are better than cars. There are times where cars are better than trains, trucks. Times when a container ship is good. If there's an ocean in the way, it's probably, probably useful. Plane works for getting stuff around quick over long distances. With that being said, every form of transportation that we have is a different tool in a tool belt. If you don't, if you, you know, you have all the tools, got to utilize the right tool for the job. All right? right. Now, in the case of the moon, I don't know. Like, so they're going to go and build a moon train. And the contract specifically mentions, like, how are you going to, like, what are we talking about here? I would assume an elevated train, right? Like Elevated? An L yeah. on the moon? Yeah, think about it, right? Are you going to sit there and grade stuff all day? Trains don't like going up hills. They don't like going up hills, and they didn't. They can go down hills, but they go. You know, you can cook the brakes if you dynamic braking. Yes, I'm a train nerd. Just in case anybody's wondering, mm -hmm. uh, they're like train. It should be flat. It should be flat, and it should be straight. Best way to do that is with an elevated with an elevated train. Unless we want to start digging lunar tunnels here. I mean. There's some guy that likes spacecraft. That. Yeah, I mean, there's a guy that likes spacecraft that also likes tunnel boring machines out there. I mean, maybe. But, I mean, what I'm really wondering is like, okay, so if they... How a train bed works, right, is like a, a, a one that would be on Earth, right? doesn't matter. I mean, high-speed rail... It doesn't matter if it's high-speed rail, freight, whatever. I mean, freight probably would be thicker because it's heavier, right? You're carrying around a heavier consist, right? So... How a train bed basically works is like you have a subgrade of gravel, right, for drainage purposes, and you have ballast on top of that. The ballast is there to distribute the weight of the train, very similar to the crawler transporter. Crawler transporter is the same idea, right? But the reason why they use the crawler transporter is they're not, they don't have a, like a single point load of like 15 million pounds, 
because SLS and a mobile launcher, it's, it's kind of heavy. Train, can you can distribute the load over the over the train, right? There's no single point area with 15 million pounds, right? So right. you have the ballast to distribute it, right? And, and like in, in the case of the crawler, the, the reason why they use the crawler is because, yeah, it's just one big heavy skyscraper of a, of a thing. With a train, right, you have rails and that's distributing the load to the ballast. And under that is drainage. So Okay, let's start ticking off boxes here. You don't need drainage, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty <laughs> sure you don't need that. So, nope. okay, what are we using for ballast here, right? And what are we using for railroad ties? A lot of train tracks either have concrete or wooden railroad ties. I'm going right, to go ahead not and guess much wood on the moon. Yeah, pretty sure. Pretty sure that doesn't exist there. I mean, it could. In greenhouses, that would be kind of cool. But, I mean, you know, we're not worried about... What's up? Lunar regolith, like concrete for the for the ties you this, using yeah exactly you this kind of goes into like go, go one of my questions about the whole concept is how much how train like will this train be like yeah there's a spectrum right of mm -hmm. one of them is just wheeled vehicles that are all connected and pulled by a engine at the front but there's not like rails and everything that's like one end of the spectrum the other end of the spectrum is like there's rails, there's ties, there's an engine on the front, maybe some sort of electrification or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm really curious, like, how trainy this train ends up being. Like, I see somebody in chat saying, could it be a monorail? Um, I don't see why it starts it playing, it's a small world, I'm going to ride it. It could oh, be yeah, a I'm, mooner rail. I'll, I'll say that. that oh, good pun. <laughs> mooner rail. Uh, the other YouTube. thing, I think that it has going for it here is the fact that again we're talking on the lunar surface where you have one sixth the gravity so in terms of the systems and everything that you might use to build to break obviously keeping in mind though that even though it's one sixth gravity it still has the same amount of mass but you know you've got that going for you which is nice and then again you do have that question are we talking like a disney style monorail or like you're in Queens and you've got the subway going above ground for a little bit. Like I said, I think, I mean, because we can't really get ballast, they can make concrete ties, but you still have to go, you still have to make up for the grade. So I, I think we're going to see something that ends up looking like a Shinkansen track. Like it's going to be, because if you can use the lunar regolith as cement, it, you know, and then you can make concrete out of that, then, you know, you're good. But even then you still have, you still have the point load of each, piling like are we piling down to bedrock what's the lunar geology like we we don't know we only we only sent one geologist there one time and he dug a hole like maybe one foot into the ground or 30 centimeters into the ground like we we need we need to take core samples here to do something like this right like right. that's that would just be smart also it's orange um it's orange in terms of like what the train looks like dude i, I you, you know you're a monitor would be good i mean sorry you were saying you, I mean, obviously you're moving similar amounts of mass, right? But right. you don't have the weight. Now that's what that's the that's simultaneously a train's Achilles heel, and also the reason why this this train can go off the rails. So trains have hey. really low. Ro yeah, 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 there you go. I'm joining in, right? <laughs> Train, <laughs> trains have really low rolling resistance. Oh no, I got Come buzzed. On, Wait, why'd you, you, got why'd you buzzer me and not them? What the heck, man? <laughs> Well, I guess we've got the fighting bell. We've got that. All we're missing is a choo-choo sound effect. Actually, there's a, train a choo -choo going choo -choo by. Effect. there's a train going by my house this very moment. Yes. Nice. As, tr as per tradition. Right. That was good I timing. mean, a monorail, a monorail might make sense uh, or some kind of maglev thing because then you don't have to deal with uh, uh, like regolith getting in bearings and things like that. Like you, there is no bearing. The best bearing is no bearing. Um, but I don't know. I imagine Maglev is relatively power, power. hungry. Power would be the so, problem yeah, there. Right. But uh, I, I, I like <laughs> the idea of an L. Um, although I, mm -hmm. I do want to go back to something you said a second ago, uh, EJ. Straight. It needs to be straight. Is that because the lower gravity, like if you have a tight turn, you might get cars coming off the track um, yeah. because there's less gravity to sort of keep them on the rails? Well, that's yeah, exactly. That's what I was getting at. Trains have a, trains have an Achilles heel, but that's simultaneously why they're so good at moving moving things around. You have low rolling resistance. On a train that works down here on Earth, you you have a metal, you have a metal wheel, metal rail. Low rolling resistance means that you you can 
you know, trains will roll forever, right? How long does it take a train to stop? Because you build up all that momentum. But that simultaneously works, you know, the weight of the train is also what gives it tractive effort. You need tractive effort, but you have tractive, tractive effort they, like I said, they make up for the low friction, the low rolling resistance by having a heavy locomotive. That's, I mean, that's any train, right? So right. You, you don't have that on the moon because the weight, I mean, these trains, what are they going to, I mean, it's going to look like an anvil going around. If you, I mean, you can make up for it. You need, the train would need to be six times uh, the mass of a normal train down here. I mean, granted, we're not just going to take like a big boy and put it on the moon. I mean, I'm sure somebody would like to see that out there. I personally, yeah, that'd be kind of cool, right? <laughs> Hi. So yeah. you have you have the, the gravity working to your advantage, but also it, stuff will come off the rails. I, I'm picturing some type of elevated train that looks like kind of like a roller coaster, right? So, okay, that's another thing I wanted to, to hit on like is... You have wheels on you, the top and the bottom. You're increasing yes, rolling okay. resistance, yep. right? But... You're, you're 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 already thinking gonna, what I'm not, thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to come off the rails. Yeah. Like trains don't like really turning. I mean, they can. They obviously the trains don't like turning because you got to slow down for a, a corner. And trains don't like going up hills. They don't like going up hills. They don't like going down hills. Right. That's really really important to understand. <laughs> That's why you know if you picture like a train in your mind moving somewhere, you know, like you're on a road next to a train. The train tracks usually like elevated because they're trying to keep the grade on the tracks. So that's a distance, uh, <clears throat> rise over run elevation, like it, grades are measured in percentages. So like if you have a 1% grade, it's for every 100 meters, you're going up one meter uh, and the percentages transfer. So it could be a hundred feet for a foot. It you could do either one, whatever your unit of measurement that you prefer. So, I mean, if we have something like a roller coaster, you could probably deal with the grades, right? But you're still, you still have you're still going to end up having low rolling resistance and on the moon that's going to work more against you than for you than it does like down here on earth does it make a difference if we're talking there it is Yonk. <laughs> Yonk. <laughs> do you think it makes a difference if we're talking distance here because it just said you know between different outposts it doesn't really specify are we talking from a mine that's you know a couple hundred meters away from the base or are we talking about a completely different research base or say a lunar telescope or something that's kilometers and kilometers away. And yes, so, I use metric. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. We don't judge you that what, much. What even is a kilometer? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know, but it sounded good. So, <laughs> I mean, Sawyer, I, I did put some thought into this dear, but I don't want to just sit here rambling all day. I mean, long story I mean, short, I'm here for it for the record, uh, please. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I mean, so what uses would you have for a train? Uh, landing sites? Probably don't want any any base near where a starship HLS is coming down because a regolith ejecta, that's probably something you don't want. Uh, I mean, yeah, that makes that's, sense. that's a good yeah. one. Um, if there's an ice mine somewhere, right? The ice mine is going to be in darkness, so because that's where the ice is on the moon. It's in the shadowed craters that are permanently shadowed at the North and South poles. Right. right. So a train going to there, I mean, you don't want your hab modules in darkness the whole time or do you, I don't know. I mean, if it was me, yes. Cause I'm a creature of the night, but not everybody <laughs> is, not everybody is built that way, <laughs> but no, it's, it's a, it's a good question to ask. And you figure the, the more infrastructure that's built up, the, if there's a base over here and a mine over there and a landing site over there, it, it just makes sense to have some sort of highly efficient, hi Alicia, uh, some sort of highly efficient um, method of transportation that goes in between all of those places. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if you guys can tell, I've put some pretty good thought into this because yeah, I'm a little bit of a train nerd. Yeah, it was just, talked about on the newest This Week in Space, which came out today. Right. Uh, you could see some of the discussions and renderings and things like that there all i know for yeah, sure ryan's is highly advanced simulation which I, I need to ask ryan where like what stock footage he's he used for this because i swear i've driven past this this junction in the in the mojave desert but huh. i could be wrong that yeah. sorry this week in space flight i'm being told i have to say the full name oh oh yeah he's ryan's getting on you in the back channel 
Okay, this week in but flight. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> this this week in flight space. <laughs> huh? Uh, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, was that, what was that stock footage that we were showing? At? That looks like Pueblo. There's a. Uh, oh, it could a, be. There's a train test track out in Colorado that's a little ways. A little, I think it's a little ways east of Denver. And I like how it, Ryan can correct Sawyer on not saying space flight in, in the name This Week in Space Flight, and yet he has remained conspicuously silent on what stock footage this is. Like, he's, there's no help from Ryan right now. Thank you, Ryan. It's obviously shot on the moon, duh. Oh, yeah, because it's white. Right, I got it. Because <laughs> it's black and white. Yeah, it's got to be on the moon. Yeah. Are there clouds on the moon? Are there moon clouds? That's the regolith that was kicked up by the trains. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh man. Anyways, I I'm 100% here for Moon Train. I think we all we all love uh, Moon Train and want to see it actually happen. Hopefully, it uh, it comes to fruition and you know doesn't just end up as another one of those studies that's um, sort of examined and then left by the wayside. So, um, oh oh. Oh, we got we got a. That doesn't tell me anything, Ryan. I I volunteered Pixels to do run. the uh, stand clear of the closing doors, please, or mind the gap. Bing, bing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I volunteered. Oh, this is the, this is the Brooklyn Brown Moon Train. train. Everyone aboard the Moon Train. Oh, no, you're saying it wrong. Then it'll be. <laughs> That's bing, more like bing. how it sounds. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I feel like we're causing psychic damage to EJ right now. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yep. Pausing? I um, think caused. Yes. I mean, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> so it makes sense for connecting different ba bases, outpost, mines, all of that stuff. Um, I mean, do you? Do we think that this is plausible? That like in the next 10, 20 years, sometime in our lifetimes, we'll see proper moon bases enough so that there's a necessity c to connect them with some sort of mass transit like this? Uh, I mean, you got to remember, this seems to be a feasibility study. So they're looking. Right. So, I mean, it, at least from what I can surmise, you'd have to look at the contract, right? Like if it's a, if it is a feasibility study, NASA is basically going to Northrop Grumman and saying, like, if you were going to build a train on the moon, how would you do it? That's, you know, figure out, figure it out, figure it out. You know, so, I mean, I, th I think it's possible. Sure. Why not? And see, I'm going to regret saying this, depending on how loud the, the bell is. I don't, honestly. I I'm going to be the pessimist on this one. Uh, like you said, yeah, it's a feasibility study. But with the way things have been going with the lunar program of even just getting there to begin with, you know, oh, the whole starting to land. And I know that's something we might discuss a little bit later on in terms of the funding to get there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of members. You're getting buzzed. Uh, <laughs> what is this, a Don show? Come on, or America's Got Talent, no, it's the, or whatever. It's doing. the Moon Train show. Circle gets the square. Oh, wait, oh, okay, never Ding. mind. <laughs> no, but I'd like to buy a vowel. I think we can see a lunar base set up but in our lifetime. is probably towards my older years, if we're being brutally honest, but... I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're wrong too, but I appreciate your real, your uh, your realistic um, assessment. You know what, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> um, if we're really doing the Gong Show, I'll go get an ice pop, then we'll be right back. All right. <laughs> For those of you that are old enough no, to get that reference, it's it's something that. I, I mean, I think clearly anybody that's a space nerd, anybody that's watching NASA Space Flight Live, anybody that knows who we are and what we do, we're all kind of on the same page. Like, we want our moon base, and we want it now. It's my moon base, and I want Don't, it now. Call 1-800-Senator-Administrator-NASA-Bill-Nye. No, no, uh, Nelson. <laughs> call 1 800 Senator Administrator NASA Bill Nelson. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but no, it, it's... Yeah, sorry. EJ, you're going to need a... You're, you're going to need, like, a, a cold beer and a sauna after this. Like, I'm sorry, man. Um, hang in there. But... For real, uh, we all want it to happen. Realistically, will it happen? Uh, it's hard to say, especially given um, how should I put this? The NASA budget fun time 
that we uh, will dis- discuss in a little bit. Uh, so that's also, you know, one of the ramifications that we need to consider to all of this. But uh, yeah. Any more moon train thoughts before we move on? I'm going to look for some moon train questions and uh, maybe I'll give your final moon train appraisal. I mean, I do appreciate that NASA, you know, it's or not even NASA, it's DARPA. I mean, I'm, it's kind of interesting that it came from DARPA, not NASA, but at least somebody, somebody, somebody in, in the government is thinking about, thinking about this kind of stuff. They're thinking about infrastructure for the moon. I think that's a pretty cool thing in general. I mean, sorry, you, I really hope you're wrong on this, but at le- hey, at least someone's thinking about it. Like, I'll take, I'll take that. I'll take it. Well, but- I believe NASA is going to be announcing their, you know, the lunar rover builder contract winners very soon. Yeah. Yeah, so that's next. They're kind of thinking week. along the again the same line I'm thinking of with all the movies and obviously the early Apollo program of, hey, you know what? Let's drive a buggy around the moon to get to where we need to go farther. Right, that's I mean, kind that of where a, I was coming from. Like, yeah. uh, what what is a moon train? Like, does a moon for it to be a train does it have to have rails? Uh, we can get into philosophical train discussions really fast, but like, is it more of a caravan where there's a, a leader? that's a vehicle that's got wheels that pulls the rest of the vehicles. And it's just yeah. a long train of, I mean, the, of wheeled road, vehicles with no tracks. Like, is that a train? I don't know. I mean, road trains could work, but see, I mean, you're, you're talking about pulling a road train over an unprepared surface. The, the regolith, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like the other thing I wanted to bring up, dude, it's like, you, you know, sorry, you just, you just commented on it. Like they're, they have, a, they still have a Rover contract here. So, no, you know, if you're building out a train, you're going to need rovers to build it anyway, right? Like, like if you go back to, you know, American history, they use the horse and buggy to build the railroad because cars didn't exist, right? So you're still going to need another avenue of transportation here. And that's what I mean about tools in your tool belt, you know? I, I, Jack, I think it'll be rails. I think it'll be something rail-based, and I think the rovers are going to build it. Yeah, that makes sense. So is NSF a train since we're always off the rails? Ugh. Well, if we're not on rails, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't we be a truck or a car then? Well, NSF Live, the truck, but the, train, car. The implication is that there are rails. We're just not using them. Jesme two thousand six is saying Starship point to point on the moon would seem more realistic. I mean, I get what I get where you're coming from in the sense that you're going to have starships on the moon, given that you're landing people there. But uh, I feel like there's a there's still logistical challenges. Like, how do you get something from where? Let, let's say lunar, like ice. You know, you're mining the ice in a crater. You bring it to the rim of the crater somehow for Rover, shipping Rover. or star shipping haha to yeah. elsewhere on the moon um does that really make sense to have a starship dedicated to that i i mean i guess it needs less infrastructure to be built but you're still dealing with like we were talking about a moment ago um regolith ejecta from engines mm-hmm. landing and what like we still don't know how that's all going to work we know starship has dedicated landing engines for the lunar variant but at the same time we we don't know that that's going to be a you know complete solution to the to the problem of exhaust plumes impinging on the surface and ejecting large amounts of regolith. We hope it is. We assume it will be, but until we actually get a Starship test landing on the moon, that's going to remain a big question. I mean, dude, like, <clears throat> so for down here, like down here on Earth, you know okay, what's the quickest and the fastest way to do something, right? An airplane. Does that mean you're going to fly to your grandma's house if she lives down the street? And, I mean, <clears throat> this is what I mean about every every piece of infrastructure has has a tool, it is a tool for, for a purpose, right? Cars are good for short distances. Trains are good for long, long, medium to long distances. And then starship hops in this particular case would be your proverbial airplane on the moon. These are all different avenues of transportation and they all have purpose. Uh, if we get, I mean, Starship, you know, with, with refueling theoretically has hundred tons down mass, like, 
if you it could bring down the equipment to make regocrete cement lunar regolith cement and then <laughs> you know another <laughs> one regocrete <laughs> chat sorry I chat said that <laughs> and then you could have another starship bring the train down and then you could use like i don't know maybe use the crane on starship to put the train on the rails or, or whatever like you know you might not want to hop around like you might like you might not want to hop around a starship you know for infrastructure purpose right same way like you wouldn't fly a 747 to go to the grocery store i mean l let's be real we all would i mean like, i would yeah yeah we all would i would give me the but, option yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be a better saying, way to do it i'm not saying it's smart or efficient mm. or that it even makes sense but i would i mean yeah, taylor no. swift would with her private jet you know you know the memes oh jeez but <laughs> in all seriousness, even here man <laughs> in all seriousness though the way that i think about it also is with like cars you typically, unless you have an off-roading vehicle, cars need a road. Trains need a track. Airplanes need a runway to land on. That, how does that infrastructure then change when you're on the lunar surface, when you can basically drive anywhere? So at that point, you can then technically essentially fly anywhere, which does make something like that more viable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chats at space turbine. Oh my gosh, <laughs> not the space trabby. Can we can we just leave that on Earth, please? <laughs> yes, we can. Hey, um, Bruce hey, in hey, chat hey. is saying, "I'm a former locomotive engineer, and EJ is spot on." I would expect oh, nothing less from EJ. I like trains. Right. What, what do you want? Train good, car bad. I no. like trains. Uh, don't yeah. don't do that. <laughs> What you realize what you're saying is like hammer good, screwdriver bad. That's what you're saying. No, no, that's yeah, not yes, what I'm saying. That's not. No, I'm saying I'm saying hammer good, worse hammer bad, is is what I'm attempting to say. <laughs> Even Jake. <laughs> like I understand your your argument that they're different tools, and I I'm not saying I never want to have a car or drive a car. I just wish so much of our infrastructure on Earth, or at least in the U.S had taken into account trains when uh, versus just i mean i'm from la it's the car city right it's the sprawl and the traffic everyone's always like oh you're from la with the traffic and it's like it's really not that bad in the grand scheme of things but also if we had functioning public transit you know like subways and trains it's better it's better for certain things train good car better, bad better tool for the job yes use, use a screwdriver for a screw and a hammer for a nail. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> um, Bart Van, I'm not even going to try and say your last name. They say they should have asked Lego instead of Northrop Grumman. They already had Futron monorail in the 80s. I'm pretty sure I had that set. Oh, yes. Ooh. That set is you amazing. Have I, I wanted it, never got it. It's a blast from the past. I yeah, know dude. of it. Uh, never actually got to call. do anything with it. The gray, the gray oh. monorail tracks with a gear, with a gear teeth in it. That thing is, that, right. that thing was awesome, dude. I love that set. Right, and then you got to like periodically take the little engine thing and like pick the pet hair out of the gear on the mo on the motor because you have way too many pets. Anyways, that's just me. Uh, Tom is saying a train like a roller coaster with wheels on the bottom. That's like, that's what we were talking about a few moments ago. I agree. Something like that makes a lot of sense given the low grav environment. Um. Bitty bit says either a train or cars. Shouldn't we first have at a minimum two moon bases with people before this makes sense? Yes, of course. This is not, they're not saying we're going to build a train tomorrow on the moon. This is just looking at one possibility for solving a problem. Should we get to a point where it's a problem that needs solving? I mean, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, let's build between two moon bases, right? It's just between two points, right? So point A and point B, why would you, and whatever the use case is for A not being near B, right? Right. And I mean, to your, one of your uh, examples earlier, like a landing pad, even if it's just mm -hmm. a landing pad, a couple hundred yards away from a habitat, mm -hmm. like think about an airport. What do you do when you're at, at most major airports? You, you go through security, then you get on the little train thing, and then 
go to the actual terminal. Even if it's not a long distance, it's still useful to have a, a device to shuttle people from one place to the other. Even if they're horrible wheeled trains that don't actually have rails and all of that. What, this is have, Orlando have, Mayor, Buddy Dwyer. You've been Orlando too much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you've been flying you Orlando know, too much if that's the case with Mayor Daly. If you know, you know. And then when you leave, he's like, thanks for being in Orlando. And it's like, you got it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that whole announcement could be like, welcome to Orlando. We have Disney World. Click. Right. Like, right. you know why you're here. We know why you're here. Come here. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Not World. even we have Disney Click. World. It's just, we know why you're here. Yep. Summer doesn't exist here. Or winter it's doesn't always, exist here. It's yeah, always it's summer. always summer. Therefore, it's been a long day. <laughs> we hope you don't enjoy seasons. Is that the sequel yeah. to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? It's Always Summer in Orlando? Dude, I, I went to Philly once and it was, you know, raining. So, I mean, show the whole show is kind of a lie. Just, just Q, Q, lie. off go the rails. And, and finally here, JC5000 <laughs> is saying, if the rails can mesh with a gear, you can take it up a mountain. Just don't have smooth rail trains and you don't have many of the problems talked about. I mean, we even have geared yeah, trains here on Earth. I mean, I grew up uh, for a short period of time in Colorado, right near right near um, Pikes Peak, and there was a cog railway that went yeah. up the dang mountain <laughs> using geared. Uh, well, it had regular wheels, and it had a, a fifth like geared wheel. Anyways, I don't think it exists anymore. But either way, yeah. that's a thing. Good point, um, JC I mean, five thousand. Yeah, that's a, that's a good call. Cog trains can go up very high grades you can get like a 30 or 40 percent grade with a cog railway so like if you were trying to elevate resources out of a crater like you were saying jack that might that might not be the worst idea right i like this i feel like we should have like a nsf live think tank <laughs> and maybe we'll get some darpa funding <laughs> yeah i thought you were gonna say shark tank for a second or a dragon's den but yeah also yes <laughs> do, do you guys watch uh, i think you should leave Fine, I will. You didn't have to be mean about it. I mean, no. Okay, well, it's a really amazing show. I think you should leave. They do a Shark Tank bit. It's it's amazing. Um, anyways, moving on. Ab Abhaya Teal, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Choo choo, you get Discord access. So stop on into the station. I don't know where I'm going with this. You get Discord access at Capcom and above. So thanks for becoming a member and uh, pop into the member Discord. Also, members uh, in the member Discord, we're doing a pre-show uh, uh, for NASA Space Flight Live. So if you were in the pre-show earlier, thanks for being in the pre-show. And if you want to be a part of the pre-show where you can see us freaking out about technical issues and or riffing on whatever we're going to talk about in a less uh, structured way, pre-show exists. Um, Bideford, we love you, nobody Bideford. Need, nobody, Thank nobody you for the support. Bideford can what? see that, though. Yeah, but it's, it's just for Bideford, nobody else. Um, <laughs> they say orange for Jack, EJ, and Sawyer. Only Sawyer, choo choo. <laughs> <laughs> choo choo. John, oh, Love God. I always, I always get John's name wrong. John Depker. You got I think it. I got that right. John Depker, hey, thanks for gifting 10 Red Team memberships. You're awesome for that. And if you got one from John or anybody else, be sure to thank them. Um, and glancing at chat, Spidea just says funicular. Which is a fun word and also a type of train. So there you go. If you're going um, up a hill, maybe, yeah. Right. There's a really nice one in, in L.A. If you've never been on, uh, on the Angel's Flight funicular, it's like a 100-year-old something uh, thing that goes up the hillside in, in downtown L.A. right across from the Grand Central Market. Highly recommend. You know there's a subway terminal that's like a couple blocks away from that. Yes, <laughs> actually. Okay, so again, car bad, train good. The, the trains that we do have in L.A., really nice. Like for a long time when I worked downtown, I would take the subway. And it was oh. so nice because I didn't have well, to wait in traffic. Yeah, the one I'm talking about is abandoned. So. Oh. Uh, subway terminal is it the red, building. Is it a, the red line? Or no, it's like the actual terminal building. The subway terminal building, yeah. Back electric hmm. subway terminal building. It used to go, like, actually, basically to where you are. Yeah, for people commuting into downtown. Anybody, pa any pack electric fans out there? No? Pacific Electric? Yeah. I'm more yeah. of a Pacific Bell guy, but I can do Pacific Electric, too. I would say MTA, but no one's actually a fan of them. But <laughs> East Coast Subway. 
my the, the subways in Boston are are not worth mentioning. No, that. Oh, I had fun adventures with that. Yeah, it wasn't even accessible too when I tried to get on one. That was fun. yeah. We don't yeah we don't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, John Depker again with the ten dollars super chat. Thank you, John. Uh, they say we thinking maglev technology like the Shinkansen in Japan. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, definitely not a bad call, but yeah, power is probably going to end up being the, a constraint there. Um, but well, hey, I mean, if you need to haul a whole bunch of solar panels out to a solar farm away from your hab, train, mm-hmm. train good. There you go. That's not a bad idea. I don't. I don't think we'll see anything like maglev. I mean, m- maybe it's possible. There, there are power consumption needs, but I mean, until like we we get abundant power on the moon, like. I mean, let's, okay, maybe we put like a nuclear power plant up there or something. Right. Don't say it can't be done. It could be. I, I, I can see, I could see somebody going, no, no, no. no Arguably no. should be. I mean, I would rather mm. see a small power station, like a nuclear yeah. power plant on the moon versus blanketing the moon in solar panels. As somebody who has seen the deserts of the American Southwest over the last decade or so progressively blanketed in solar panels. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for renewable energy and I'm all for, um, harnessing the sun for electricity however we can but also not i'm i'm for not disturbing pristine habitats in the name of megalithic commercial power generation but that's so far off the rails anyways good luck rails, with the next one, jack so so you like coal power no i don't <laughs> you thanks. sure thanks yeah i'm sure coal bad it just ticked all it just ticked all the boxes that you just no said. just no just no, that's, <laughs> no coal power is is a megalithic it's a commercial thing like if everybody had solar panels on their roof and generated power for themselves we wouldn't need to blanket the entire freaking desert and destroy habitats but anyways i'm gonna be real careful saying Good this luck. next one thank you bullet hole shooter thank you so much for the hundred dollar tip that's an insane amount of money thank you they say oh, here's bullet some more. Hole's back? yes yeah bullet hole is back that and, and awesome. I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm taking extreme care every time i say their name um, they say here's some more thanks for the hours and hours of endless content thank you bullet hole shooter uh we appreciate you so much um even even though your name is amazing it's am- yes, it, it is amazing. Although I'm I'm gun shy. I'm a little bit gun shy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. Well, it's not like you've mis- mispronounced it for anything. No, of course not. Yeah, right. It's not like I said the most embarrassing thing I've said on stream. Even counting that time, I shouted at a guy whose parents I thought were dead, and they weren't actually dead <laughs> to like thirty thousand people. <laughs> it's not that. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not even gonna ask. <laughs> It was like SN8 or something. That guy came up to me. Guy, a friend of the show, Ray. He's awesome. Uh, anyways, Tom Dalton, thank you for the support. I think I killed oh EJ. Uh, no, that's a thing that happened. It's a, it's a thing. I can't, I, laugh I can't at take it, it what back. Can you do? I mean, yeah, dude, right. That's, I've been, I've been in content creation for a long time. You know, the one thing that you could be absolutely sure of is that you're gonna say something dumb eventually. Right. You know, or you just be all abs- the time in the case you, of me. Huh, you can be absolutely sure. So it's all about how you react to that. You know, you could be like, oh, my God, I mean, or you, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of funny. Everybody knows you're just kidding. No, you didn't mean it. It's not like you wish death on this guy's parents, you know? Right, right. It's not uh, like it's recorded John, for all eternity on the Internet or anything. It's fine. Right. It's not like you can go back to the SN8 live stream to exactly like three hours in and then. Yeah, anyways, John Depker, <laughs> thank you again for the super chat. They say, could superconductivity be used instead of electromagnetism for propulsion? I know nothing about superconductivity and almost nothing about electromagnetism, so I'm going to stop talking and maybe EJ will say something smart sounding. Hey. Uh, Sawyer, how's your electrical engineering? Yeah, yeah. My degrees yeah. in broadcast journalism. Okay, I got this one. All right, <laughs> cool. Yep. All right, so. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're moving, if, if we do, have, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I saw somebody in chat say, you know, locks diesel locomotive, and I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of here for that. I'm not going to lie to you, Nit- like a nitrous diesel 
locomotive on the moon. That'd be kind of cool. You could ha- take those carbon emissions and use it to grow plants. I'm just saying, carbon is not the devil. Carbon emissions aren't the devil on the moon. You could use that to... That's not actually a bad idea, right? If you just have a capture mechanism. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure the train's going to end up being electric, right? And if it is, right. and you have overhead wires, you, if you have overhead candid areas in a, in a locomotive with, with a pantograph on it, right? Yeah, dude, you could... You could really go far with that because you're you're essentially moving in a vacuum like you can get you, you because there's no atmosphere. You get you get good conductivity that way. Now, I don't know about superconductivity. Maybe it's possible. That's like, I don't know, like, say somebody's walking around on the train tracks, right, in their space suit, just doing their space thing. And, you, you know, the current could arc through the lunar regolith that's just kind of floating around. So. I mean, there's trade-offs here, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, that, that might work. It might, it might work. I mean, the lunar regolith is charged. We know that like, it's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, like that's, it's the same deal How with much? like Mars, you know, like with Insight, Insight couldn't clean off its solar panels. You know, people are like, oh, why doesn't NASA just put a fan on it? Like, well, it's because it's, the regolith is charged and it's static electricity is sticking it to the solar panels. You know, you need more than a just like a compressed bit of air. Anyway, Jack, what were you saying? Uh, no, I just I, a thought occurs. We were talking about maglev and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's less gravity on the moon. Does that mean it would take less power to levitate a maglev type vehicle on the moon, given that there's less gravity? Because we were that's one of the things we sort of touched on, like right off the bat, was yeah, maglev would be cool, but we're probably power constrained. But then in, in my head, it was like oh. But there's less gravity, so maybe less power needed? Question mark. I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't know if you could tell. Well, this is this is just basic physics, dude. I mean, you have one sixth the gravitational acceleration that you would on Earth, so it, theoretically it would take less power. But even then, you, it's still the same mass. You still, I mean, you still have to. You, I mean, you, you might you might need to. You could yeah, you could use less. You'd, you'd have less power because, yeah, that's what weight is. It's just gravity effect, a force affected on mass or gravitational force affected on a mass. But at the same time, like even then, the power consumption would be absurd. Like this is something that not a lot of people kind of consider. Like I don't, I don't think it's in the public lexicon about power consumption needs for spacecraft. Like look at the ISS. I mean, you look at the amount of like places where humans can go versus the rest of the space station. Look at those those gigantic solar arrays, and then even with the gigantic, right. with the gigantic solar arrays, you have the rollout solar arrays that are in front of that. Power right. demands are still at a premium on the ISS, e- even with the upgraded solar panels, even with how big those solar panels are. The, you know, we can generate power down here willy nilly, but you know, in space, everything is more difficult. Even going to the bathroom, right? Like if that if just that is like a difficult thing to do. You know, power generation can get, I mean, you, yeah, obviously there's solar, right? But, you know, what, what happens during the lunar night? You know, lunar nights are 14 days. Now what? Now where's your power coming from? This is what I right. mean about power consumption and demand, right? I when mean, some a nuclear are, power station on the moon? I don't mind that idea. <laughs> the only thing with a nuke is the heat. You'd need a closed loop cooling thing and you'd need your radiators would need to be like the size of a football stadium. Your football or my football, either one. Hear me out. Molten boron. What'd you call me? What is that? (laughs) What does that do? Nobody, nobody does it like molten boron. Oh, geez. It's a, I thought, I thought you would get on board with this, with the Futurama reference, EJ. You know what? I I, I, I can't hit home runs all the time. We could use dimondium. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Um, oh, I think I lost it. Sean Bannon in chat was saying, wouldn't maglev draw in dust? Same as with the static charge thing, which I hadn't considered, but yeah, that would also yep. be yep. Uh, highly suboptimal. I mean, do we all want maglev trains on the moon? How cool would that actually be? That would be awesome, yes. right? But yes, at the end of the day, there's a very good reason why most trains that operate down here have wheels. Can we? A, a wheel we is do... a lot easier to do should we do a moon train tier list like s tier moon train maglev a tier moon train big boy steam engine using lunar water i would say b tier cog moon train 
F tier moon train would be like that doesn't have rails. It's just a convoy of cars. Yeah. Pulled like, by. Yeah. Yeah. Like a I don't Australian know. There's, there's your, train, mate. There's your moon train to your and list. Uh, F tier would be a robot pull... just pulling it. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Space mule pulling a space cart. <laughs> um, bullet hole shooter gifting 50 red team memberships. Thank you, buddy. Extremely generous of you. And now 50 people that wouldn't have had the membership program otherwise now do. So be sure you thank Bullet Hole Shooter uh, for their very generous contribution there. Unbelievably generous. Thank you, as always. We see your name often, and we really, really appreciate it. We Let me just say, it's a, name, it's a name you don't forget. It's just not, it's not a forgettable name <laughs> for whatever we reason. The, we <laughs> see the name, but we don't say the name. <laughs> Telstar86, thank you for the support. They say, now I'm boarding the 420 hyperlink train to the moon. Sign me up. <laughs> Daniel I mean, Hogbin, thank ahead, you for ahead. gifting five red team memberships. Oh, boy, huh. yeah? I was going to say, some people are talking about like hyperloops. I mean, you'd have to pressurize the tube, but it's not. A, I mean, I prefer the train moving around in the vacuum personally, but it's not a bad idea. It could work. That's also what Jake does at 3 a.m. when he's buzzed. He just does hyperloops. <laughs> Why do cats do it in the morning? Like it, it's like 3 a.m. and the cat's like, I am going to haul butt around this entire house for 30 minutes. Like, exactly. What, are you doing? <laughs> what? What is? What's going on? Call the Bondulins. I'm. I'm not familiar with... Is he trying to play us off? I don't know. I'm not familiar with what this thing is. Uh, bullet oh, that's hole Jake. shooter. Oh, since you can't... Thank can't you just use yakety sax? Or is that a copyright Probably. Thing? That's... No, I think no. you... Uh, I don't it, think so. Is yakety sax public domain yet? Nope, no, apparently I guess not. not. Uh, bullet hole shooter, thank you. $10 super chat. They say, I keep thinking of the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, but on the moon. Bam. So let's write a spec script. Let's sell it to Hollywood. Planes, trains, rockets, and moon bases. I don't know. We'll, we'll workshop the name, but we'll get uh, the ghost of John Candy, and we'll get Steve Martin, and the ghost of Chris Farley, and that one lady who was in Home Alone also, and we'll just do like a whole... It'll be great. <laughs> I'm not good with act actors and actresses' names. Can you tell? Yeah. No. Uh, is The Martian just planes, trains, and automobiles on Mars? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like I feel like there would have needed to be another character along with uh, Mark Watney in order to like you know annoy him the whole time. But I would be so yeah. here for that. I would be so here for that. Yeah. Also, I'm now thinking of Rocket Man. That's what I was just about to say. That's more Rocket <laughs> Man, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chat, yeah, Catherine, Catherine O'Hara is who Jack was talking about. There you go. The yeah, thank you Catherine. for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh Matt PD, thank you for the support. They say Airy Fund. Also, LA Metro is decent. I S H. I mean, yeah, it's decent if you exist in an area around where the LA Metro is. Like, for example, this is so off the rails. I had to take a bus to the subway station. Like, there wasn't just a subway in my area, but also, you know, mountains and fault lines and all the other fun California things. So I get it, but it could, it could be a much more robust network. Like, when I go to New York, I'm like, wow, I can go anywhere I want without having to use a car because public transit is proper here. Um, Jack, I got like a question. Alley do you no. think that? Do you, sorry, Blake. Uh, Blake, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Do you think L LA's highway system is good? No. Why not? Why would I think that? Well, because there's a fine line between a badly designed system and then an overpopulated system. I think LA's highway no, I, system is fine. You've been playing if, too much Russian city skylines. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> Shh. I mean, t like, tell me the system is fine when you're on the 405 going south at rush oh, hour. I've driven, like, I've driven it's, on the 405. It, it, it's, it's a great just, highway. It's a great design. It's just it was designed for half the population. I mean, we could we could about we it. could go down this rabbit hole for for quite a while. I think we had good public transit 
in LA for a long time. And then there's the whole GM buying up all the different small rail line things. And then that's uh, what Pack Electric scra- is, dude. Yeah. Scrapping them all. And then now they built a bunch of highways everywhere when we had a better solution. And now it's just, it's just not, you know, go watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit chat. Just go watch that. Grid system in for the win of... until you get to the village. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Blake Alexander gifting five red team memberships. Thank you. And Zorg FX guy. Thank you for the support. They say, is NSF planning to do something for the upcoming eclipse? Yes. I don't Stay know. Tuned. We'll see. I, I may have spent an ungodly amount of money on a solar telescope. So stay tuned. There may be a map and work of all <laughs> trying to figure out where everyone's going to be to get as much coverage of the totality as possible. We can have total Dude. totality coverage. The dish. I don't know. I just wanted to say the dish. Um, cool. Well, that's Moon Train for you. Anybody else have anything else on Moon Train, or should we move on to Starship? I think it's time to choo-choo on to the next station. Train kept the rolling all night long. So, I sang along with you there. The heave and a hoe, and I just couldn't tell her no, 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 no. No, right. where, where are you guys? I, got, you I, I sang along, Bro, dude. Come on. Do you not know? Do you not? Yeah, no. <laughs> Sawyer's good. Jack, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? You don't know who? You don't know who sing that song? You don't know who no. sings it? Really? Nope. What? Oh, jeez. Nope. It's time. It's time for me to be bad at a, at a pop culture reference. It's about time. Jack, tell him, please. You're talking about the Aerosmith is... song, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I like good music. Dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Welcome to NSF Live. Uh, I'm Jack Beyer for NSF. We're joined this week by the moon and Sawyer. Sawyer, how you doing, buddy? Let me start with the poem. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not that again. Yeah, uh, moon, it's been good seeing you lately. So, uh, yeah, thanks for well, joining thank us. You, sir. I'm just well, here. This, lately, this baby can hold shot. so much ice. Look Slaps moon. Hey, look, if we pan down bed. from the moon, we see Starbase, which Did you might just say be a great trans- down? tilt down. Sawyer, you have a degree in broadcast journalism. If we tilt down from the moon, you might happen to see Starbase, which I think leads us into our next topic. Okay, maybe I didn't tilt into my pan smooth transition, but let's roll on. Oh, I don't even know Sky what to cam. say anymore. Uh, really quickly, bullet hole shooter again with a hundred dollar super chat. Bullet hole shooter. I feel like at this point, you're you're just trying to make me slip. Like you're. He's, uh, he's just looking for a Travis. Dude. We have a, We have an update to their name. I can just call them Travis now. Travis, thank you. We appreciate oh. the support. That's an insane amount of support. I don't even. I. It's a huge amount of money. Like wow, thank you. Uh, there's no. <laughs> there's no authentic way I can accurately express my appreciation other than saying thank you so much. We'll keep doing what we do, thanks to your support. Um, You're welcome. Oh, wait. No, sorry. It's got to be your bowl. (laughs) You can get a good look at a T-bone steak. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No. No, Sorry. It's got to be your bowl. You have derailed. Oh, man. I was just looking at the the rotary girder. uh, (laughs) Blake Alexander. Sorry. Yeah. Blake Alexander, thanks for the super chat. They say, here's to a private company getting the moon train contract and not the Cal High Speed Rail Authority. Yes. <laughs> Dear God, yes. Dear God. Talk about it. No, you know what? I'm just not I'm just not gonna I'm just not, I'm just not gonna we, we could spend a whole hour no. me yelling about oh. the California high speed oh. rail. Um, oh, that's spicy. Oh, we're, oh. Oh, we're going to build oh. the, the rail from oh. Bakersfield to Lancaster and Palmdale. Who would care? Okay, anyways. Uh well, Starship, that, I think it was huh? Wendover did a good video on that. That was he the did. whole point why I, why I suggested the LA highway system because the design has a lot to do with it too, right? Like that was that was why I brought this up and why I asked you that question, right? Because in the you know it all depends. And it, actually, one of the one of the people that tipped the stream said that you know like why do they need a moon train? Maybe do that when we have two moon bases because the design of this is what it's doing is going to figure way into how the train is designed. And if it goes to nowhere, it could be Jack. It could be a monorail. Moonorail. You know what I'm saying. Yep. 
<laughs> could be monorail simpson no oh, monorail there you go all right good i've built monorails in shelbyville ogdenville and brockway and that surely put them on the map i don't remember the exact line no no that was that was fine that was good enough anyway so i so i want starship let's go i mean to be fair i think we all want starship um but now i'm just sad that phil hartman has uh is not with us anymore respect what a legend i, th I think we need to change our name to uh NTF NASA train fun fan train we fan have, <laughs> yeah we've gone no, we a could, lot there you go fan we could talk about trains bright lines going by me again so yeah we could oh we could talk trains chat I'll, I'll, I could talk trains with you for like eight hours we could I'm do that pretty sure most people I mean subscribe for space stuff well okay all what right, if fine. I, one of my favorite streams we've ever done was the arrival of the SRBs for Artemis one Yes. Um, on the yes. SRB train, like I remember train, that space best friends. Do not like do it not hump. doesn't get better than that. Do not yeah, do not hump the do not hump the SRB train. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not it's not good to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean, I mean it, it says it. It says it right on there. Do not hump. Yeah, it's yeah, it's there. I mean, another thing you you know we want to we want to incorporate trains into space flight. How far back do we want to go? Like. You know, the ITL Causeway, the Air Force used Alco S2 switcher locomotives to move Titan mobile launchers between Pad 40 and 41 and the SMARF and the VAB. Just saying. Just saying. The crawler transporters, they have Alco 261C diesel, V16 supercharged diesels in them. Those are absolutely locomotive engines. I'm just saying. There are Trains a lot have a lot of, to do with space flight. There are a lot of random abandoned rail tracks all across Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. That, that part makes me sad. I don't like that part. Yeah, well, then why do you like the L.A. highways? Because there's <laughs> Cause lots a... of abandoned rail in L.A. as well. well to, Does that make highways, you sad? No, the highways are a good design. It's just designed for half the population. That was the whole point yeah, but of that. It, but even if you designed them to be double the capacity, there's induced demand. Like there, the, the more lanes you add, the more cars there will be on the ne There's never a solution. Just mass transit is the solution, but we're too dumb. We're just too dumb. Nerds. All right, so Starship. Uh, hey, what, what tweet uh, just do we have here? Good old Chris Davenport. I don't know if I can call him that, but I'm doing it. Uh, with the Washington Post, um, tweeted out that at a panel at the satellite conference, Gwen Shotwell says that SpaceX should be ready to star star fly ship. What's <laughs> uh, my brain? You okay, fly. Starship again in about six weeks. Uh, teams are still reviewing the data from the last flight, and that Flight 4 would not have satellites aboard. So there you go. A little, couple little nuggets of information there. Uh, Chris also tweeting that when added that the goal for Starship this year is to reach orbit, deploy satellites, and recover both stages. And of course, yes. to launch Falcon 9 a whole bunch of times. So, wow. That I mean, yeah, we spend pretty, so much good. time on good. our streams, sort of trying to ask ourselves the hypotheticals. You know, when do you think the first catch attempt will be? When do you think they will launch? Uh, is this live? Because it looks like it's frozen. But it says it's live. But That's it's a statue dedicated to the SpaceX workers that did the it's thing. Space Iwo Jima, yeah. Spacewood, uh, Spacewood Jima. Yeah, there oh you go. Gosh. Star, 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 would, anyways. Um, so we ask ourselves these hypotheticals a lot. You know, when do you think the first catch will be? When do you think um, they'll, they'll launch one with satellites on it? Uh, when do you think they'll actually do a real orbit? And so these little bits of information that we got are, are providing us with some answers, some welcome answers. So Flight 4, not going to have satellites. Goal for this year... Which, as a reminder, SpaceX has previously asked the FAA to launch, oh, what was it, six or nine? There's been a lot of numbers thrown around, but SpaceX wants to launch a bunch more times this year. So, Flight 4, no it satellites. Six. I think there it was go. just six to nine in general. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yes. <laughs> All right. See, EJ, um, I'm not always a disappointment. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's so yeah, good. we um, it's it's some welcome information, right? Yeah, uh, 
I just want to just want to point out that during the last NSF live, I said they'd be catching, attempting to catch by the end of the year. Mm. Hold it. Chad, I'll take nice. that W. Thank you very although, much. Although it doesn't necessarily say catch it, it says recover. Yeah, I mean, I can mm. see them doing a soft landing and then towing it into the port, something like that, assuming it floats, which, I mean, it's basically a big empty air tank at that point. Chad said no. <laughs> You're not going to give me my W. <laughs> Chad <laughs> says no. Said I'll give no. you the W. You All can right. have the W. Thank I mean, you. given the Thank fact that one of the proposals was if it lands in one piece and it doesn't sink, it's to shoot it with bullets, then I think they think it can float. I think hmm. I think bullet hole shooter might have uh, something to say about that. But that the name is not. Yeah. The, never mind. Right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, so, I can't get a W unless they do a water landing first. Well, to be, you know I, what, I think they you, will. I think they will. You said that the they should have an L on the moon, and I consider that a W. Oh. Uh. By the way, while we're talking about the fact that SpaceX wants to actually recover it this year, it's, which still blows my mind, the question of, are they going to be using the chopsticks? Are they going to go for the soft splashdown? I, I mean, the way that they have evolved with recovering these vehicles to pick up all their launch cadence, it, it blows my mind. In fact, we actually just put out a video this week talking about SpaceX's recovery efforts with uh, Falcon 9 and all the drone ship landings and things like that. I think that's kind of a really great kind of co-video to the idea here of will, you know, them actually finally testing that recovery of Starship now from either the water or trying the chopsticks and maybe some damage to some towers. But yeah, go check out that other video if you haven't on the channel. Yeah, let's see if we can get uh, mods to link that in chat. That would be rad, because it's a great video. Um, so, what flight are we thinking they actually attempt to catch? Uh, clearly not on Flight 4, but I would believe that Flight 4 attempts a soft splashdown of the booster and ship. So, maybe a catch by Flight 5, assuming they can nail down a soft splashdown? Because, again, we did not see a successful landing of the booster on the last flight. Something went yeah. awry, shall something, we say. Yeah, so, yeah, something went yeah, awry. Yeah, we'll call it that. I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, yeah, that's a good that's a good way to that's a good way to say that. Um it, it really depends on you know what kind of data they're gonna get from the next mission. It, you know, do does that booster perform, you know, a good, you know, hover slam slash in uh, splashdown, right? To Starship, make it all the way uh, to you know to the to the surface of the ocean, you know, and do the most legendary belly flop of all time. I it really because SpaceX uses this iterative design, right? You, you know, it's they're they're a little um, less risk adverse than you know you see with uh, with other aerospace companies. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that they send it; they they're willing to send it more it, because that's how you learn. You learn the most from there. You know, and if Flight 4 basically does exactly what Flight 4 is supposed to do, I don't see why we wouldn't get a booster recovery sometime soon, right? But right. also at the same time, I don't think they would risk a pad with a catch attempt either. But in the same breath, you have the second tower segments are at Sanchez ready to be put together. Right. You know, they're staging parts clearly. So the second tower is clearly in the pipeline somewhere. I don't think they yeah. would risk a catch until they do that. That mean, you know, like how long did it take to make the first o OLM? Like eight months. So that kind of tracks. Well, eight months does not track with the end of the year because this. Oh yeah, it kind of does. I was gonna say this year's going by way too quickly, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, so yeah, that kind of all tracks towards you know trying to catch one by the end of the year with how SpaceX is moving equipment around. And a good I'm point that. Super... Um... Go ahead, sir. I say a good point that was brought up in the background by Ryan Weber here in our back channel. Hi, Ryan. Are these chopsticks even capable of catching currently? I mean, we've seen them hacking away pieces of it, if you recall, right before a flight. They were literally cutting parts off of it. Uh, are they going to have to add certain things, change certain things for the actual recovery portion of it? So I think that might play a role too, and that might be something 
that we see get installed on that second tower. Some form of extra cladding, some extra connection point or something for that grab. Well, so this is something we talk about also a lot because, you know, it's one of the big upcoming milestones for the Starship program in terms of, EJ, are, are you, would you be legitimately concerned about a, a catch gone wrong damaging the ground infrastructure in a significant way? I mean, it's, it's essentially an empty tank at that point with very little propellant, although it is still an extremely massive, you know, steel tube. So the weight of it falling would be bad, but I don't necessarily see like the uh, massive explosion necessarily like tanking out the tank farm or something like that, unless they, you know, score a direct hit like rods from God style on the tank nice. farm with the booster. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. If, if it was me and you had a rud anywhere near your ground service equipment, it, I don't think it necessarily would damage much. I mean, it wouldn't certainly wouldn't damage it any more than IFT one did, right? Like. You know, I mean, never say never, right? But right. at that point, dude, how do you know that all your systems are completely intact? Like, th yeah. think about it. Think about it for a second. It's not going to take much. It, it, you know, there could be one pipe that got hit by a piece of, you know, uh, piece of the rocket that exploded. And, you know, you guys, I mean, you guys all seen the NASA spaceflight van. You know what happens when rockets Destro destroy and damage things. You're going to get ejected, just like what we were talking about on the moon. You right. know, the van got a big piece of ejected. You know, all that has to do is hit a pipe in the wrong spot, and it might not be might not be noticeable. You might notice it later. Like, you know, that's the thing about that's the thing about these pads. I mean, Jack, we we talked about it last week on NSF Live about the crazy amount of propellant transfer that they're working with here to fuel Starship. Starship gets fueled in less than an hour. Yeah, it's like a These thousand just, tons every 10 minutes or something. It's, it's insane. It's frankly absurd. Uh, and having something exploding, having something exploding next to that in a way that's not a rocket launch, you know, I, I would say go over all the GSE. Like you, you don't want to, you don't want to play games with that stuff. I mean, just, yeah, you know, we, we're, we're going to talk about Delta. We're going to talk about the L70 mission. Delta is a good example of why you don't play games with GSE. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a very it's, good point. Right? Also, why launching a lot is good because then your pad never sits fallow for a long period of time, and then you yep. put a rocket on it, and it's like, oh, let's scrub six times. Anyways, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you don't? You sure? Because yeah. <laughs> I certainly do from Vandenberg heavies. Um, yeah. But no, it, it to me, the forces uh, from launch are so much more dramatic and intense that a, a booster coming back like personally i don't see them waiting until they have a second tower to attempt catching like i think the second tower and the second pat what is with these lines on my oh my god the sun is setting here i look like some sort of solar zebra i hate it uh, <laughs> i don't even remember what i was what i was talking about um it's a totally yeah, i don't to think the jack wow i wow sawyer i don't think they will wait till they have a second tower um to do catches like I, I think they'll attempt it well before the second tower and second pad is built because that's still like a solid year away at least and if they want to attempt that stuff before the end of the year they're going to have to do it with the hardware that they currently have so that's my take anyways but, but the main question that we were talking about here is what flight do we think that they actually go for the orbit, the satellite deployment, and trying this catch. I, I think this might even be pole worthy, but where do we think that's, how many flights in this year? Assuming there's at least six more this year, potentially nine, what flight number big, onward do you think? Big assumption. I'm, I'm going to start off and say, I think there will be a maximum of three more flights this year. Maybe that's on the low side, but you know, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, and I think once they get a successful soft splashdown of the booster, they'll like immediately, Ian, you can't be DMing me stuff like this. We're live. Like you can't do that. I can't, I can't be reading stuff like that live on air, buddy. Um, <laughs> like I can, what? Do we want to Somebody know? else. <laughs> no, you, I, I will not. Uh, 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 so, uh, some, uh, I, somebody I else you. talk. Go. I got go. you. 
Um, it really, like I said, it depends on how how good these missions go. I mean, if we kind of extrapolate the rate of progress from flight one to flight flight three, I would say it's going to happen sooner rather than later. First operational mission, I'll say flight six, flat five or six. Well, you know, eh, let's go fives. You know, back with it. I'll, I'll be the optimist here, right? I'll be the optimist here. Uh, flight six. I mean, maybe yeah, no five. Let's go with five. I think flight four is going to work. Flight four is basically the same exact from from what i understand it's the same exact trajectory indian ocean belly flop as flight three and once again you're kind of extrapolating the rate of progress from like flight one flight two to flight three and even taking into account like changing a crazy variable to your vehicle like staging you know uh i i'd say flight five we'll, we'll go flight five at least for some some payloads and i'm not sure about recovery maybe it might who knows i once am again, inclined the, to agree this iterative design teaches you the most. You're going to learn the most. So you're going to, with with rapid iterative prototyping, you're going to see the most amount of changes between each flight. Elon said himself on, on X that there's thousands of changes to this vehicle, uh, of flight three, most likely from what they learned from flight two and uh, data from flight one. I mean, I don't know what data from flight one would help you, but I mean, don't unless you want to do a barrel roll, do the, a barrel roll. Main. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, exactly also, right. yes, do a barrel roll. <laughs> do a flip. So, you know, I, I'd say the Starship is going to hit, I'm not going to say operational, but the, the rate of progress is going to be something that I don't think it, we're going to see coming. You know, it's it's going to happen a lot faster than you think. I mean, like I said, just look at how how much further they've gotten every single flight. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it really, it really makes sense to to think that flight four will be a full success. I, I think that's completely plausible. And if they get a successful soft splashdown of the booster, why not try like start trying catching at that yeah. point? So I, I think I think flight five for a catch and probably also for payload deploy, um, flight five. Like let's go, let's do this, let's knock this out. The booster mm -hmm. has proven that it can do its job. Let's start using it to do so. Sawyer, you have thoughts, I know. Go. I do, yes. Uh, many of them I can't say on air. But in terms of this, uh, <laughs> no, my, my feeling is that, you know, Flight 4, get the flight profile down. You know, maybe this be the final suborbital. Flight 5, you go orbital. At that point, you know, hopefully with Flight 4, you get that soft splash down. Then for the fifth flight, you get orbit. And maybe you try for the soft splash down there of uh, Starship, of the ship portion of it itself. And then you get to flight six. That's when you load in the satellites. And that's when you focus in on, all right, we've got the orbit down. We've got the soft splash downs down. Now let's try for recovery. So I would say flight six. Yeah. All right. Plausible. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be somewhere in there. I mean, I don't, a storm is brewing. The Starship Storm. I don't. I don't think people are ready for it. I mean, the guys were SpaceX is already with their iterative with rapid iterative prototyping. They're hitting a launch with Starship like every three to four months already, and you know we were saying six to nine flights. Jack, I, I mean, you, you you might be right that it might be three more for the year, but like I said, the rate of iteration here. As you fly more, you're going to learn more, and you will progress a lot faster. Absolutely. And, and uh, to be clear, I'm not trying to be like uh, Donnie no, no, Downer you. over here. Like, three more flights for this rocket before the end of the year would be insane. Like, yes, six would be insane. Nine would be insane. But, uh, I mean, we're going to talk about Delta Heavy here in a minute. Delta Four Heavy flew... Uh, what was it like? Fifteen times in in uh, ten years, twenty years? Yeah, fifteen times in twenty years. I think the first flight was in two thousand four. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the brand new, largely untested, you know, crazy new technology on the cutting edge system that is Starship to fly three times more in the what is essentially its inaugural year of flight. Um, well, I guess we're about there coming up on April. But either way, you get the point. Three, three, even three more times this year would be madness and amazing, and SpaceX would learn a whole bunch. So, yep. 
Don't get me wrong. But I think you're right, EJ. The more that they fly, the more they'll learn. And it's just all it's just a feedback loop. That's how SpaceX rolls. Like that's how it works. So it's just a matter of time. Yeah, and ironically they, with this, just really quick to point out, normally yep, yep. we get these as, you know, Elon time. Elon tweeting out of, oh, we're two weeks away, which we know means like two months away. This is Gwyn time, which still means we're probably closer to like eight weeks away, but I mean I, I trust nothing, her numbers a little bit more. Nothing Absolutely. nothing in space flight happens when you think it's going to happen. Take when you think it's going to happen, times that by pi. That's actually when it's going to happen. It's not just the yeah. one. That's the entire yeah. industry. Like, not wrong. Look at, the, look, at, look at just the time it takes to get stuff going. I mean, you know. yeah. And, and there are just physical limitations in play still while SpaceX is still learning. Like just the other day we saw SpaceX pulling the flex hoses off of the booster QD because they got absolutely roasted um, by launch. Like if you're trying to launch once every couple of weeks or once every week or whatever, you can't be having to refurb major parts of your pad like that, which surely as they launch more uh, and as they iterate, they will get to a point where that is not necessary, but we're not there yet. Although it does feel like we're rapidly approaching that territory. Yeah, it's going to happen a lot faster than people think. It's like it's like how Falcon 9 turned into this once a month launch vehicle to like once a day launch vehicle seemingly like overnight. It just Right. You're you're building. SpaceX has they have the institutional knowledge. They have the industrial base and they have the tools and the talent. Don't stare in the trap. They'll, I think they'll get it. I think it'll happen a lot faster than than, you know, it feels. Yeah. That said, I think a ship catch, like the statement from Gwen was mm. like recovering both vehicles. A ship catch to me still feels pretty far out. Like I'm going to say 2025 for a ship catch. Booster catch, completely plausible to me that they try this year. Whether or not they succeed, plausible that they try this year. Ship, that's a whole different worm, ball of worm mm. games. Yeah. Sure. I mean, Jack, there was actually a... Um... A super chat in there and somebody somebody asked about like landing legs or you know why don't they just use falcon 9 can you can you pull that thing up is that possible yes because that was a good question uh bu -bu -bu -bu. was it a super I, I i i'm not sure if it was a super it was a tip in chat i don't know what that's called on youtube sorry i'm, I'm from the twitch world guys my, my bad it might have been a resub you, yeah you're good i'm looking i'm looking mm -hmm. I, I mean essentially so about, it's like the yeah, one about ahead. piggybacking off of Falcon 9's infrastructure yes. with landing legs? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Theo. Theo with the 499 Super Chat. Thank you, Theo. They say, why don't they piggyback off of the Falcon 9 infrastructure and go with landing legs and drone ship? Is it a scaling problem? Homework is done. Yet, I, I think I think that's a, that's a scaling problem. The booster is so huge that adding legs that are suitable for it, you, it's very easily to add a lot of mass to the booster very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, but I mean, EJ, go ahead. That booster's, what do we think the booster dry mass is? Alex, Alex, back channel me. I know you know this. Uh, it's uh, that, I don't know. I'm not sure you can get a landing leg to hold that thing up. Uh, and even then, uh, your, the load that would be exerted on four landing legs is yeah. Two, yeah. The dry mass is 200 plus tons. Number Alex says a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Falcon Thanks, Nine Alex. is Falcon Nine empty. It's not even close. Not even you're not even close. There's the what? What would Falcon Nine empty be? Twenty tons, maybe. Where volume has a lot to do with it, you know. Uh, and, and you know, coming more coming back more on like he said more on nice <laughs> coming back more on <laughs> to, to, nice na, uh, to Starship uh, Jack. I, I think in, in sorry, like guys, I think that. Uh, I think that catching the booster is more what SpaceX's focus is. Starship, maybe they'll maybe they'll go back to those like flip out legs or something, maybe. Or maybe they'll just put some type of landing, like passive landing thing on the side of Starship. But I don't I, I think that them getting the booster is much, much more like in the um like things that you need to solve quick because once again, Artemis is on the horizon. We're looking at right. a lunar landing, yeah. eight, what, 18 months? Right. You need to launch a lot. And SpaceX could theoretically do get HLS out to the moon with expendable starships. 
right? You could do that. And you could use that as an excuse to, you know, after a Starship has refueled, you, you get landing data on entry, descent, and landing, like how they used customer missions to land first stages, right? right. But super heavy is the real thing here. That's the real big deal. I, I firmly believe that, you know, like that is in the critical pathway to getting HLS up there. Without super heavy, oh, great. Starship can land. That's fine. Lovely. Good. How does that get the, How does that get one of those things to the moon? Super heavy is the real key here. And yes. I think that, you know, after the HLS contract was awarded, SpaceX really pivoted away from doing tests like SN15, which is a shame because that was amazing, right? Oh, I miss those to, so much. Yeah. yeah, dude, they're so good, right? Yeah, they, they pivoted away and they focused much more on first stage zero and getting super heavy. Like they went all hands on to super heavy and Elon had that whole thing about, you know, Raptor production, making sure we get... Uh, our assembly line for Raptors producing X amount of units a day, or else we could bankrupt could be a theoretical possibility. Like oh, everything, yeah, they, I remember that. <laughs> right? They everything that they've done since HLS like has been awarded has been pivoting towards getting stage zero and super heavy working. I think that's much more in the critical pathway than a Starship landing. So, what, how is this pertinent? I think that putting legs on super heavy one, it's it's it, it's heavy. It's in the name. Yeah, I don't think you can make any type of landing leg that would that wouldn't completely destroy your mass fraction on that thing work. That Jack, that's what you were saying. Second, right. of, second of all, like if Starship if Starship EDL and landing is not, I mean, that's not in the critical path for Artemis missions, right? It's not. You know, you're refueling you're refueling HLS up on orbit, and I don't, you know, what does NASA care what it, what they do with that after? Just like first stages with Falcon Nine when they were testing, so. I think we'd be much more likely to see some landing legs attached to Starship or something uh, than we I would. Do miss, like, I do yeah. miss the little nubby legs that the little, would like little flip out. out. Yeah, the, yeah, the little flip out nubbins adorable. with the crush cores. And it's funny right? because we say little flip out nubbins, but they are actually like person size, like insanely yeah, heavy right? person sized things because Starship is just. Kevin, can we change the view? Like, I feel like I'm, I'm covered in bees. Like, this is yeah. taking me back to when I was a beekeeper and I got attacked by an Africanized hive. Like, can we not? Thank you. Not the bees. Wait, you, were, you were a beekeeper? For a hey, very what? brief period of time, yes. Back before I went to film school when I was finding odd jobs on Craigslist. That is a fun huh. era of my life. I, I can Off see Craigslist. that. I don't, I don't know why. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can see that. I, I don't yeah, know she, why. I don't know what it is. Not gonna lie, if I had like space and time, I would absolutely uh, you would keep bees. Keep... I would, yeah, oh. it's it's a really fun hobby, and uh, you know it's just good to help the bees. Bees good, bees good. Mosquitoes bad. So we need Don't an apiary fund. Don't kill me with the tool fund. for the job speech. <laughs> apiary yeah, fund NSF now for honey. Jack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. So yeah, to your point, EJ, I, I do think that makes a lot of sense. You know, you can chuck a, a tanker starship here and there, and it's not the worst, you know, end of the world. Um, but chucking thirty-three Raptors every time you lose a booster is uh, no bueno. So, right? yeah, would you rather lose thirty-three or six, right? Potentially nine so, in the future as well. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, potentially nine. I mean, still not thirty-three. Like, I think that. Yeah, it's something that I mentioned from from last week as well. I, I think we we kind of you know we saw those crazy views from like Starship re-entering, and that was awesome. Don't get me wrong, that was great. But I think the the true thing, the true big thing here is that SpaceX had two flights back to back where Super Heavy on its ascent, big asterisk there, <laughs> on its ascent performed great. It, it performed perfectly. They sequenced thirty three engines, got thirty three engines running, no flameouts, all the way to most engine cutoff, right? And then everything after that is playing with house money, which is nuts. Right. Yeah. Also bacon. I see chat talking about bacon. Now I'm hungry. Yeah, Thank chat, you for that. Chat is fixating on bacon and bees. <laughs> space bees, to be specific. <laughs> have bees been into space yet? Because they should have. Yes. They, they should have. send bees to space. Shuttle mission. Yep. Yes, they have. Do, do they still make hexagonal hives? Yep. Mm -hmm. Or is it like a weird blob? No, no, Sawyer. It, it was a shuttle mission, right? It, it was, was a I shuttle think it was mission. SCS yeah. SCS I believe it took D. them some time, but they they ended up actually just they adapting adapt. and creating it still. Yeah, same with mouses. Mouses learned to fly around in zero g. That was actually a more recent ISS test. Of yeah. which there are a few of them just launched on CRS thirty. By the way, we have more mouse. Yeah, astronauts. Yay, astronauts. Yep. Yeah, there was a uh, that was a student experiment on. 
he couldn't catch What's up? Him. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, too. Like, Someday, Jake. I feel like a cat, a cat in zero G is going to like the first time we get some proper cat in zero G content, the internet is going to break, especially like cat zoomies in zero G is just going to be complete chaos. And I'm so here for it. I mean, there are great videos of people that will, you know, go in a Cessna and do the sort of zero G style parabola. And you just see the cat in the background going crazy. It's a, it's an old classic video. Mm -hmm. It's hysterical. You up for it, Jake? He says yes. I think I, yeah, I think he'd be think he'd be he'd get down on that. Stabby Unicorn, thank you for the fifty dollar tip to tips.nasaspaceflight. I got got bugs all over me, man. What is with this view? Das says uh, keep that view up because uh, <laughs> he he needs everybody to know the horror that he has to work in. That's true. I mean, that is that is the name of the game. Ooh, McGregor, oh, we're getting an engine firing right on. now. A, a raptor oh. firing out at McGregor. Hopefully this one doesn't uh, croak, right? I've right. I heard, heard one croak yeah, today. Yeah, earlier this morning, there was a, a rud on the tripod stand. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, that's Oops. why we test. Right? That's why we yeah. have McGregor Live. So make sure you keep McGregor Live in your NSF live stream rotation. And that is, by the way, in the path of totality. That's All where right. I think that's where I'm going to end up for... Uh, for the eclipse is i think i'm gonna to go to mcgregor hang out with our mcgregor crew and uh hope to see some raptor firings while i'm there uh yep, stabby yeah. unicorn 50 dollars tip thank you they say a reminder that buffalo 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 is a valid sentence which it is i would like to there's also a german version that's like rebarbara 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 it's something like that uh there's a bunch of these there's a there's also a French one, um, taunt, 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 like taunt, 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 something like that. Well, there's yeah. also mirror, 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 mirror. Anyways, yes, language, it's fun. What is it? Uh, thank you, Stab Unicorn, for that insanity. Um, Travis, aka Bullet Hole Shooter, thank you <laughs> for another hundred dollar uh, tip. That's insane. You're the man, Travis. Thank you. We really appreciate it. They say you need to slip once in a while. I recently passed through Mojave and got to see Strato Launcher outside the hangar. That was a sight to see. Oh, yeah, I'm glad man. you got to see that. Rock is an amazing aircraft. Uh, what a beast. It holds a special place in my heart. They just conducted a uh, their first successful powered flight. So, mad props Talon. to the entire Strato Launch team. Y'all are the best. Yeah, Talon with the TA1. That was amazing. Right. I am. I am so here for Strato Launch uh, for hypersonic research to be you know, less of an unattainable thing. And also, I think at some point they're going to be landing talons at Vandenberg, which I am also 100% here for. More Vandenberg, more more better. And Sawyer's yep. going to be like, oh, but you're not going to be able to see it because of the fog. And I'm going to say, shut up, Sawyer. Oh, you're not going to be able to see it because of the fog. Shut up, mm -hmm. Sawyer. <laughs> I mean, I just want to point out here, gentlemen, that we had a hypersonic reentry system with really nice cross range capability in the seventies. Dinosaur? You're talking about dinosaur, right? Y y shenanigans? You're talking about shenanigans, right? <laughs> <laughs> I swear if one more person says shenanigans, I will pistol whip them. <laughs> hey Farmer, what's that place you like to eat with all the crap on the walls? <laughs> you mean shenanigans? Shenanigans? Oh. shenanigans. Not on the keyboard. Not on the keyboard. <laughs> Not on the keyboard. Casey, yeah, thank you, you know. for the store purchase. They say, love the live stream. Do you think they will oh, land Starship boy. on a pad or be caught by the chopsticks first? I assume chopsticks, but never say never. Was that for Starship or Super Heavy? Starship, specifically. Ooh, and they got I... a print. No, hey, all right. Oh, yes. Print it. I mean, it's like what we were saying before. I, I think we would be more inclined to see something like a S-15 landing, right? Uh, than we would from like, a, you know, landing on a pad or something than we would a catch with Starship. However, you know, I'm not going to say I don't want to see Starship get caught by the chopsticks. Like, I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think we all want to see that. That would be, that'd probably be one of the like wildest things ever. Yes, please. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. 
Very yeah. yes, please. <clears throat> yep. I will. I will second the yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, Wes Irvin with a ninety-nine dollar super chat. Thank you so much, Wes. That's outstanding of you. They say Hamon Iberico is right up there with bacon, uh, and I do oh. have confirmation from our back channel, specifically Alex, that it is delicious. So forget the back channel. Uh, Hamon Iberico is oh, it's it's kind of like a cured bacony type bit. It's like a mix between bacon and prosciutto in a way. It's just nice. It's got the perfect amount of fat ratio to it. It's dude. It's Pricey, but worth it. Is it like the gabagool? <laughs> the gabagool. Oh, it, puts, it puts the gabagool like the... to shame. Nobody puts gabagool in the corner, Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Say hello Lynette. to my little friend. <laughs> wow. Lynette, you never you never cease to surprise me, Sawyer. Thank you for becoming a red <laughs> team member, Lynette. That's Wes Irvin with another super chat. Say how awesome... How awesome I'm will that Jack suntan be? Oh, because I had the sun on my face. Um, thankfully, it's gone now. Just me. Thank you for the support. They say thoughts that they might just do some small hops to test chopsticks for landing. Nope. Uh, I mean, as cool as that would be, I don't I don't see that happening anytime soon. You're every look every time you launch in super heavy. It's you know, you're risking the pat. You're risking the pat mm -hmm. in some way, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna sequence thirty three engines, get thirty three engines firing, and get that thing off the pad, you might as well do it with a starship on the top. It's not that much more of a stretch to put payload up there and have it fly an ascent trajectory and then come back down and land rather than doing a like a grasshopper or an F nine R Dev one. Well, Dev one never flew or, or Dev two. Uh, there's, I mean, Dev Dev two flew. It landed, but in pieces. But it it flew fly but uh I, I think spacex has a lot of i think they have enough experience with propulsive landings it's really you know i don't think we need to see something go up and come back down i think all the data that they're going to get from doing the splashdown style landings like what we want like <laughs> we didn't see it during ift3 <laughs> we saw something i don't know if that would be called the landing but there, uh, <laughs> there did appear to be a splash of sorts <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean something hit the water something it was i don't know if it was a booster but uh right maybe pieces of the booster something hit the water does that help but uh probably many things <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean yeah you know it's yeah i think i mean i think i think that that yeah if they're gonna launch it they're gonna launch a whole thing might as well you need, right. you need a lot of data on ascent. There's a lot of missions in the critical path. Like it's what I was talking about before. There's a lot of missions in the critical pathway. You got to, space exercise on the prizes on HLS right now. I mean, I'm pretty, pretty dang sure that's no insider information. I'm not, I'm not cool enough to get that. So I just kind of have to turn the gears. It's like, there's a bunch of mouses with hamster wheels up here. You know, we turn the gears. So, uh, the HLS is, that's where, that's where they're going for. Everything has been moving towards that, getting that thing ready to go. Uh, so, you got to think about like what is the simplest way with the hardware that they have to get HLS HLS into rectilinear halo orbit and down to the surface of the moon. What's the quickest way it gets to a rendezvous with that Orion capsule? Uh, what do you absolutely need? What do you not absolutely need? Like the tiles, for instance. We saw the tiles on previous starships. They they were a little little jank. I mean, they were better on this last one. They were better on twenty eight, right? But, you know, that's not like in the critical path. Like having a starship come back down is not that big of a deal when you have SpaceX's production base. They're cranking out starships and Raptors left and right, which is, once again, like there, there's a future where, you know, they don't get full reuse working by the time HLS rolls around and they just refuel with expendable starships, which I don't think I want that future, but it's, a, it is, it's feasible. That would still be a way to deliver on the contract and get it done. What he said. Yeah. Yeah. No, nothing to add. Sorry. I'm a chatterbox today. My, my bad. We, I we, like trains. That, that's why we love you. Uh, JC Davis, <laughs> thank you thank for you. the super chat. They say, planning on going to Starbase to see the first booster landing. See you all there. Ah, come on by and say hi and grab a patch and a sticker. Tom Dalton, Wait, thank you, you for the support. Say, 
Yes. Kate just has patches. Yeah. Come on, we're slacking here. Well, you know, you, we gotta we gotta change it up. You know, if you find Dos, you'll get a patch, probably also a sticker. If you find me, you'll get a sticker, maybe also a patch. You never know. That's why you gotta come on down to Starbase and and find us while we're frantically working to keep things <laughs> running ahead of uh, the next flight. Tom Dalton, thank you for the support. They say a flight four is complete is a complete success, then at least one more before they try to catch, have to duplicate success to prove it's not a fluke. Yeah, that's that's a fair, um, you know, yep. a fair assessment of how things may go. L Mad, thank you for the super chat. They say, instead of legs on the booster, how about a landing platform on the ground? Hear me out. All right, hear me out. How about um, the launch tower also has, like, big army arm kind of things uh maybe like a, like a like a you call them like chopsticks you know and they the booster lands like in between them and and the they, the tower catches the booster and then it puts it on a, a platform no, yeah Does those, that sound those completely arms, insane those arms look good you know they, you know they're they're made with consummate v's if you look at the camera yeah <laughs> i think that's a good idea that that'll never work i don't think anyone would even consider trying something like that. Could you imagine how ridiculous that would look to have these two arms just like sticking out, waiting to and then closing in? Crazy talk. Right. Mechazilla, his arms wide. Shock of the wall, or Elon, the walls fell? I don't know. <laughs> Timba in, in the, oh God, I don't remember the, it's such a good episode of Star Trek. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, Jack. Darmok and Jalad on the ocean. Yes, thank you. Timba, his arms wide. Um, bullet thank hole you, sheer. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. <laughs> they, they say, I visited the Thing Museum in Benson, Arizona, where they talk about world history when aliens versus dinosaurs happened. What are the chances history will repeat itself? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Not saying yes. it was aliens, but it was aliens. But it was aliens. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cool. All right. Well, let's uh, take a moment to appreciate the awesome offerings that we have in our lovely merch store. We've seen some people picking some things up here and there on uh, on today's show. Hey, look, it's a Polaris flyover metal print shot by myself. Pick it up if you are so inclined. I would be very honored if anybody enjoyed this image enough to have it on their wall. But if you don't, Guess what? There's a whole bunch of other stuff in the store from Flight 3, including patch t-shirts, mugs, and a whole bunch of other prints from other folks on the team. So run on over to shop.nessaspaceflight.com. Yet another way you can support what we do and get a little something in return. Reentry Club. I love this. I love it. I love it. Is, is that a country club? I, I could be. And you don't have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. To get membership, you just have to get into orbit, right. and then right. re-enter. Yeah, well, yeah. above above all of the known space lines, at least. There you go, the McDowell line at the very at the bare minimum. Yeah. Is this the man uh, who wrecked the buffet at the reentry club this morning? <laughs> what? I sorry, don't know. I don't know. Oh. JC, I yeah, I don't. I'm sorry. You know what, EJ? I'm not going to get all the references. Uh, normally, I'm the I'm one sorry. giving people crud for it's not right. getting the pop culture references. But it's whenever fine. we're doing NSF Live, there's like a role reversal thing. And you know what? I'm here for it. I deserve it. Bugs. Bugs all over me. Um, okay. JC Davis, thank you for the support. They say, doesn't Starship need permission to fly over the western U.S. to land? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the shuttle did it. That's fine. We'll figure it out. Shuttle flew across pretty much the entire southeastern part of the country. She got back to Kennedy, right. even. Mm -hmm. Right. Shuttle, uh, shuttle. Yeah, oh, yeah, there it is. Like clockwork. Ding, there's Chris B. Yep. You know, if, if you look in the mirror and say, shuttle three times fast, Chris B will appear. It Chris B appears and says, dirty leads, and then goes away. <laughs> That's all he does. Hmm. Uh... All right, so let's move on to our next topic, which is not really a fun one. We don't have to spend a bunch of time on it if we don't want to, but NASA budget not increased, which is not cool. 
because uh, it's probably going to lead to the shuttering of the Chandra X-ray telescope, which is one of NASA's great observatories. I, I, I don't know how to sugarcoat this. It stinks. I hate it. And I'm mad about it. And it's not only just Chandra. It's also funding for Artemis. I mean, you look at what happened with the space shuttle. And for so long, that program was pushing a bow wave where they got the bare minimum amount of funding necessary. And they kept pushing things off. They cut the number of orbiters they could fly. They cut things that were initially planned that were then never done. Um, and... And we're just doing the same stupid budgetary dance all over again. Uh, Artemis V has been delayed um, until 20, 20, March of 2030, if I'm not mistaken. It's just... Uh, speaking of history repeating itself, it's just annoying that we're asking NASA to do so much more with essentially less because they're getting a flat... The, the, there's no increase to the budget. So it, it's just... Do all Dude, of this. Go back to the moon. Build the gateway, uh, and oh. and also, you know, operate the ISS and spend a whole cartload of money on SLS. And oh, by the way, we're not giving you any more money to do it. It's just, ugh. I don't know. That's all I have for the budget thing. I, if if anybody wants to rant about it, be my guest because I'm not happy about it. But I will also say I'm not surprised, unfortunately. I mean, uh, in terms of the budgetary numbers, it's it's not like it's really down, it's up, but it's still the same that we had for 2023. It's really stagnant in a way. And it, it really hurts that you're taking all these science observatories and deciding, all right, these are the things that need to go. Uh, I know it's a balance. Artemis, that's the big ticket item for them. That's the thing that people know about, they see about, they hear about, they want the astronauts. So human spaceflight tends to get a lot of the money, if not all of the money, that they ask for. Where are you going to take it from? A lot of that comes from Earth-observing satellites that help us every day. Uh, Solar-observing satellites, which obviously solar winds and solar weather, extremely important. And then you get other ones like Chandra that... Yeah, I mean, it's basically its own version of Hubble with the amazing discoveries that it's done. The difference is Hubble had James Webb to kind of be its successor, even though they're not one-to-one. -one. Right. Chandra doesn't have that. There is no real replacement for what it's doing, in the, even considered right now in the works. So imagine trying to build that, then you're talking like a decade. So it's, it hurts. It really does. I mean, put it I'll put it this way: what is the the NASA budget request? Is like twenty seven billion, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, which I, I think it was sounds tw twenty four. Sounds half, like a lot. Twenty four. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Some, sounds something like a lot. Like that. But uh, okay, let's look at something else that the government has spent money on: the Comanche. EJ, you remember the Comanche uh, helicopter? Uh, dude, this, we spent. Oh, man. We spent like forty billion dollars trying to make a stealth helicopter. It, I'm sorry. Do you know anything about helicopters? They're loud. Yes, there's things you can do to limit their radar return, but like stealth and helicopter are two things that do not go together. And we roasted forty billion dollars on on this insanity. And that's not the only time that we've attempted to make some sort of next generation helicopter and roasted tens of billions of dollars on it. And yet NASA is like, can we have 20 billion? And the government's like, no, it's just, ugh, it's, it's so frustrating. EJ, uh, I can't even talk. I'm so mad. Please say something intelligent. <laughs> I mean, Comanche was cool. And it was cool, but yeah, like everybody's like, oh, why are we wasting money on space? We should be fixing problems on Earth first. And it's <sighs> like, you know what? We can do both. And also we have plenty of money to do it. It's just there's no political will to do it because we're stupid and disappointing. Less than half the 1% uh, of the entire federal budget ends up going to NASA. Isn't it half a percentage? I, I thought it was less than... It's yeah, no, not even one Sawyer. Right, not that's one, it, less one, than one penny. half of one yeah. percent. 
Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, the mic cut out. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm less deaf. than half of 1% yeah. of the entire federal budget goes to NASA. And the return that we get, I know people always say, why are we going to space when there's problems on Earth and things like that? The latest numbers uh, when it comes to NASA spinoffs is that for every dollar that we spend on things going into space, we get approximately $7 back in terms of products, research, advancements, things that help us back here on Earth. That's why I fight so passionately for it and why I'm sure Jack and you guys all are angry when you see people saying, oh, we don't need to go to space. Oh, their budget should be slashed even more. Because what are we giving them, 10, 15%? It's just billionaires that want to leave Earth. There's so much, it's just, it makes me so mad. Yeah, you know what? (sighs) I want you to get up right now. I want you to go to your window. I want you to stick your head out and shout, I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> nice. Nice. I'm mad as heck and I'm it's not appropriate gonna in this spot. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm with you guys on that. I, you know, like, Jack, I'm, I'm not, you're, you're not wrong. Well, he's gone. <laughs> I was going to say. Okay, yeah, no, I, the, the, neighbors, the neighbors here are like, what just happened? <laughs> did, you, did you do it? All right, sweet. Nice. Uh, nice. Um, okay. Wasn't expecting that. Um, I don't know, <laughs> fellas. Uh, there's really no way to explain this like short story, right? Like there's no, there's no way to, to really do that. I mean, is, are these budget numbers not ideal? Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty bad. Um, you know, you guys say are saying it's flat budgeted, right? Like, that's bad. That's that's not flat budgeting because of inflation. That's actually defunding it because the value of the dollar is different than it was, right? So, you know, if if NASA's budget going into 2020 was 24 billion and it and it's still 24 billion now, that's defunding. That's not the same amount of cash here. That's why we're seeing this. That's why we're seeing the, you know, cut to these programs, you know. The and I don't I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't think it's good. I don't think that people that say, you know, oh, we should be fixing problems down here. I always, you know, I understand where they're coming from. But what I try to do, sorry, like you were saying, you vehemently push for it. Like the science budget includes Earth's observation. It includes imaging satellites. It includes meteorological satellites. Those are, those are part of NASA's budget. And those are helping observe the climate from space. That helps us fix problems down here. And I'm not, I'm not talking like, you know, oh, well, the climate is changing. We got to climb it. No, no, no. I'm talking about a satellite that's going to see where a storm is, where a storm is coming. So you can evacuate people. So you arguably, arguably these satellites fix a lot of problems. You can track a storm a lot better with the GOES satellites than you can by just going outside and putting your finger up or even a Doppler radar, right? These technologies and, you know, so much of NASA's science budget does help and fix problems down here. Now, simultaneously, you know, the human space flight element of it, you know, ISS, the scientific research that goes up there, they're looking for technologies to help us live on the moon. Like, you know, we're trying to, so you want to solve climate change problems, basically living on the moon. If you can, if you can sustain yourself on the moon, well, there's no excuse for the technologies invented, not being able to sustain yourself down here on earth. Those technologies, Sawyer, as you said, seven, seven bucks for every dollar spent. Those technologies help us do that and not for a lot of money. Now, they they help us do that not not for that much. It's less than a penny on the dollar for every tax dollar. Now, Jack, I mean, you you brought up the Comanche helicopter, right? The Comanche's cool. I think that thing was sweet. That thing was really cool. For what it's worth, I think a stealth helicopter is doable. Uh, You know, you could potentially get shock off the, you know, shock off the end of the rotors that would screw a radar signature, but that's why it had that little bend at the end of the rotors. on A little the scimitar thing. Yeah, I get and it. That little, I'm not little saying, wing of, yeah. I'm not <laughs> saying it's impossible to do, just for the record. I, I, I'm, and I'm yeah. not saying we shouldn't have a stealth helicopter. I mm-hmm. just think it's a, it's a decent illustration of things we are willing to spend a lot of money on that 
might sound a little bit ridiculous on its surface <laughs> versus i yeah. don't know yeah. funding science at nasa well, yeah no for for real absolutely i mean but see here's here's the here's the thing here's the thing that i don't know you guys knew it along this i always kind of turn this around in my head you know defense spending is not necessarily bad for nasa you know a lot of people i see you don't know, say like oh i wish nasa had the defense budgets i think that's gross overfunding i don't think space flight is that expensive you know you're not gonna you're not gonna get a hundred bucks to go to the store to buy a gallon of milk right you change a hundred people be like eh, okay right you, you you know, but defense spending does bolster our aerospace industrial base, right? So that ends up being good for your institutional knowledge and your industry base on the ground here. And that can be leveraged for NASA. Look at how many military technologies in the past found their way to NASA. Um, Atlas, just saying, how many, how many, how many probes to other planets has an Atlas V launched? You know, Mars 2020 off the top of my head, like there's, and there's a, there's a plethora more. I don't know if you count it as a probe, but insight as well. Yeah, there you go. I mean, d I would argue that defense spending helps helps NASA. Like even if you go back to projects from the 80s, the Strategic Defense Initiative, you know, and then, you know, even Star Wars, if you go, you know, which is, I mean, that's kind of the same thing, but these projects do help. Now, you know, going back to the whole thing, like, you know, you could sit here and it sucks. Like, you know, we, I know you guys, you know, and, and we know who we're talking to here. I, it, it should be done. That's budget should be double what it is right now. Like there's no excuse for not having a moon base right now. Like, why can't I take a vacation to the moon right now? This is ridiculous. Right. I could, I could definitely see that, but you know, I mean, that it's true, but I think it's like, it's difficult to sit here and just be like, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Like, you know, so instead of sitting here and like, it, like Jack, it, I like it drives you up the wall. And I know if I just sit there and think about it for a second, it'll drive me up the wall too. So, you know, I, I think coming up with a solution in this regard would probably be more productive, right? So here, let, here it goes, right? You know, there's the budget for NASA and there's these cuts to the science programs, you know, and we always talk about sustainable programs. NASA loves that word. They love sustainable. They make it sustainable, make it sustainable. And it ends up, it's interesting because that ends up being like comparing these scientific missions through their operational phase of systems engineering to, you know, like you have exploration systems development and they seem to always be at odds with each other, funding for human exploration operations, funding for uh, exploration ground systems, right? Uh, funding for the science mission directorate. They always seem to be at each other. You know, I, there's ways, there's ways to fix this. There's ways, not fix it. There's ways to make this a lot more robust in terms of funding. Now, it seems like NASA has been able to do that somehow with SLS. And I, you know, I'm going to get grilled for saying this, but anybody trying to get rid of that thing, that's not happening. It's not happening. Like I've seen many of people over the last decade, that are like cancel it. It's Starship cancel it. It's too expensive. Like, I would argue that you know you see total cost involved with NASA, so you're they always have to show you the entire bill, and it's always going to seem more expensive than what you see in the private market, for instance, right? But you know that that seems to be very sustainable. So, like, it, it's obviously not going anywhere, right? It, it's for it's to hedge long term goals. Because, well, on a side note, it's 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 to hedge NASA's long term goals for human spaceflight operations because they tried to pull the plug on it in 2011. They tried to pull the plug on the thing like everything, uh, you know, you know, that that 30 billion dollars that they said they saved when they canceled Constellation. Well, you know, NASA's what are we in the hole now, like 45 billion since Constellation got canceled or something. Right. Right. You know, that certainly seems a lot cheaper now. But uh you, you know, I think finding ways to get these programs to depend on each other is, is what NASA needs to do to prevent this kind of things from happening. Like we have science missions that are going up against, they're going up against, you know, human exploration operations. And then you see the science people yell, you know, get, you know, oh, it's us or them, it's us or them. No, I think we should find, dude, chat for real. Speaking of funding, oh, thank you, Mr. Space Pope. I love your hat. Thank you very much. 
And then Blake right there with five before that message retracted. Uh, I don't know what you said, but <laughs> yeah. damn. Um, Jack, he's taking sorry, the job. I, yeah, sorry. No, by all means. Seriously, thank um, you, Space Pope. Yeah. I love your hat. <laughs> so, uh, Space Pope. Does that mean there's a I Space think, Pope mobile? Dude, yeah. It's called the Space Shuttle. Nice. Obviously. Nice. Like, Seriously, thank you, Space Pope. So, yeah, okay. yeah, that was extremely generous, really. Yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's just all yeah, of the all of the support is appreciated. I want to make that very clear. We do genuinely appreciate everything from, you know, a dollar to something as generous as this and it doesn't go to waste. It somehow yeah. funds us talking about these crazy things off the rails here and mm -hmm. allows us to have cameras to show it to you as well out in the field. So, <laughs> so Indeed. yeah, sorry guys, I, I, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. So instead of having these programs kind of at each other's throats, you want to make something sustainable, you, you work them together. Like you, you work them together. You, you try to find ways to work this stuff together. So, and you can leverage the commercial market to do that. So how about, you know, NASA works on climate and earth observation satellites that where service operability is a big thing. It's part of the thing that sustained the space shuttle in gave the space shuttle something to do was service the Hubble space telescope, right? Why don't we leverage commercial partners to make upgradable earth observation and meteorological satellites. So instead of making a new satellite and launching it on an expendable rocket or at least even a partially reusable rocket, make, make uh, satellite constellations where you could perform servicing on these things and upgrade them. Modular satellite buses. Those two, th that type of program would leverage the science mission directorate and human exploration operations and exploration ground systems. You could rope all this stuff together into one big program. And then, you know, the Defense Department, like I said, they always want to get in on it. Part of the reason why we got the space shuttle is because defense spending, right? Heck, part of, one could make the argument that part of the reason why we got the Saturn, the Saturn, even the, the entire Saturn uh, family of rockets is because of defense spending, because they, it was, they're derived from the Redstone missile, which is an aggregate four which was an army ballistic missile agency program. So that's defense spending right there. Once again, this stuff's all intertwined. We could figure out a way to get everybody to, to work on it, like kind of totally intertwined architecture. You're going to create the sustainability. And the, the more congressmen that you get in, or congressmen or representatives, you know, that you get in your district here with this whole integrated program, the more or the less likely it is to get defunded like this you know i don't think space is any type of partisan issue it's very much about people wanting to keep constituents or politicians wanting to keep constituents uh employed in their district because that that's actually their job to to do that you know that's you know the system actually working for a change that's pretty cool i don't hate that um, working so, in air you, quotes <laughs> working i said for i said for a change right yeah. Except for a change. Okay. So, you know, I, dude, I could sit here and I could blow hard all day about how this pisses me off because it does. Oh, it absolutely does. It hurts. It sucks. It, you know, especially as a space flight, you know, we, we do outreach, you know, Sawyer, you know, Jack, you know, Das, if you're in the back channel, Chris, you, you guys all know. And in chat, you know, everybody here, you know what we do. We're here firing on all cylinders 24 7, 365, trying to get people into space because public perception of space flight and it being seen as a vital thing is so important to NASA's funding. And you know, you, you could say, oh, well, SpaceX could do it without them, but NASA contracts are what put SpaceX in the position that, they, that they're in nowadays. They wouldn't, yep. have, would SpaceX have been inevitable? I think so. I think Elon just has over, like, dude, that guy just betting against him when it comes to getting any type of industrial project done is probably not a good idea at this point, right? You know, industrial project, right? Like that. That's he's your, the, he's he's got tenacity. You know, the guy doesn't quit, right? SpaceX eventually would have gotten to this point, but they wouldn't have gotten to it as quick without without NASA funding, without commercial orbital transport services, which was part of the Constellation program. Yeah, there I went there. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you're from my chat, you if you're from Twitch, you know what I mean. Uh, and then you know, commercial crew program, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And then HLS, 
right? Like these, these programs are, if the, the, that the leveraging the commercial market like that, and you could leverage it for the science mission director, it gets more people on board and that keeps NASA's funding nice and stable more than it already is and could potentially even increase it. You know, sorry, that was a, that was a long winded thing. I didn't say no, long story no, short this time. Uh, it, it's just, I, I think it's, it's better to try and it's better. It, it's better for my sanity. And I, I, I hope it's the same with you guys to try and figure out a way to rectify this because nobody likes this. Nobody it's here watching the stream is happy about years. this. It's been 80. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, it, you know, yeah. Simultaneously, I think it's also important to look at how funding has gone in the past. You know, the space shuttle got made because it, it everybody got enough fingers in the pie. And you can say whatever you want about the shuttle. I, I, I think the shuttle's amazing. It was a, it's an amazing piece of kit. You know, and you know, if you don't like the shuttle and you say, oh, that's just it's just a poor project. Well, what was Apollo then? You know what I mean? It's clear that this system can work. It's clear that the way that NASA gets funding can work. We put people on the moon using that system. We're the only ones that have done it. The system can be leveraged correctly. And Jack, I think this is the big thing that you touched on. It's the willpower to do it. You know? Yeah. I mean, so I, I think it's much more, uh, sorry, I just, I'm just going to conclude. I'll shut up. <laughs> I think it's much more, um, productive to try and come up with a solution here than just sit here and whine about it. You know? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that because I will just sit here and whine about it. So it's definitely, <laughs> sorry, man. If, if, no, it feels better, uh, to, to try and come up with solutions. I guess where I'm coming from is I don't feel like there's any measurable way in which I could even like propose or enact a solution i feel like uh, there's so much entrenched momentum with how nasa works and it is a jobs program and that to me isn't necessary i mean there's good and bad like yes we should employ smart people to do hard challenging jobs in the space program absolutely we should retain that expertise rather than letting it lie fallow the, the yes absolutely do I think mm -hmm. that we should have senators and and Congress people trying to get a little piece of the pie for their constituency at the expense of other parts of the program? Or like, I mean, Senator Shelby is a perfect example. Like, basically taking fuel depots off the table for an, an insane like couple decades just because they didn't like depots because it threatened their their constituent. It's just yeah, I don't know. There's, I don't want to get too political, and it's just uh, uh, put it this way. See what I mean? This is why In I offer opinion, solutions instead. A, a lot <laughs> you know of, what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot of the best films, to me, are a result yes. of the auteur setup. You know, people like your Stanley Kubrick, um, where the film is the result of a singular vision on the point of a director who makes it happen. And when you get design by committee, you get movies that ultimately end up, a lot of the time, I'm not gonna say all the time, but a lot of the time, they don't have a soul. And they don't know what they're trying to be. They're just trying to please the most amount of people and, <clears throat> and, and get through it that way. <clears throat> and I, I, I feel like Starship, in a lot of ways, is akin to what I'm talking about with like a movie made by an auteur, by a singular director, Elon. And a lot of the things that we like about Starship are the result of it not having been designed by committee. And so I hesitate to ascribe good things to, to that methodology, I guess, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No I mean, soul and trying to please everyone. So you're saying it's ginger. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh geez. Shh, Jake will hear you. Jake will hear you. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. I mean, Jack, that's that's up to the that's up to the executive. The executive branch is the one that denotes NASA's plan. You know, right? If like I'm not pointing fingers. Pointing fingers is a waste of time. That's what people who don't know how to solve problems do. You know, it's up to the executive. You know, you go back to the Apollo program, President Kennedy. We chose to go to the moon, right? We chose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they are hard. That's where that singular power comes from. It comes from, actually, it's particularly in this scenario, it's the vice president, you know, because the National Space Council and 
how we have it set up nowadays. But it comes from for NASA's funding. It comes from the executive, you know. And if space flight isn't a priority for the executive, then for the executive branch, then there you go. But here's the thing: it's up to us to let them know. It's up to us. That's why I do what I do. That's Sawyer. That's why you do what you do. That Jack. That's why you do. That's why everybody here does what we do, right? We're, tr- yeah. we're, we're trying to get people interested in space flight and show how it's cool. And most importantly, show that it's vital. It's vital. It's so important. They're yeah, not going to know because I like hearing myself talk. Something. But yes, no, it is. I mean, it's really I about do. spreading awareness. Like the, the fact that so many people don't realize basic things on their phone, in their car, in their kitchen, and the mm-hmm. electric drills all came from NASA's. These little things that people don't realize that they Tang. use every single day. Tang? No? Tang, Tang yes, was Tang. not. It's no. Tang was not it's a NASA o- invention, neither was Velcro. But it's orange. <laughs> the coolest was seeing Velcro first introduced on um Oh, I I forget if it was I think it was to tell not to tell the truth. Uh one of the old what's my line type shows. I've got a secret, that was it. In the very early days, they had someone like a secretary basically walking upside down with the Velcro hook and loop, as they called it. Yes, hook and loop. It's the, it's the non-proprietary eponym for Velcro. It's great. Huh. Uh, all right, well, I don't know. Let's talk about something else. I'm bummed. That's what, that's <laughs> what I mean, dudes. We, you, can't, you can't sit there because, dude, see, you say this, this is, not, this is not good. That's why I always, you know, I get asked this a lot on my end. I always try to come up with a solution. Have the programs work together. Intertwine all the programs. Stop pitting science mission directorate against human exploration directorate. That's 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 not going to get us anywhere. And that, once again, it comes down to the willpower. And you know, a politician will do it if we let them know. We have to let them know. We have to be the squeaky wheel in this regard. When we're not the squeaky wheel, stuff like this happens. Yeah, you're here. Yeah, you want to talk about something happier? Let's talk about a rocket's final flight ever. Oh wait, that's that's. that's- uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to end the show on a downer, but uh, <laughs> final Delta Four Heavy launching on the 28th, assuming no scrubs, which is a big assumption considering Delta Four Heavy. But <laughs> that's uh, that's what's going to be coming up here at the end of the month. What is it? NROL 91? Seven. Something 70, like that. Yeah. Is it 70, chat? Uh, it no, it is... Uh, oh, um... I should know this. 70? Yeah, it's 70. Yeah. Okay, 70. My bad. All good, man. So, Actually, launching, launching a classified payload yeah. for the National Reconnaissance Office, which I personally love any kind of spooky payloads. Um, also, I'd like to point out all of these views are from Vandenberg. Vandenberg is better, but I digress. Fog. How do we how do we feel I don't see any fog in this image. Looks great to me. What about the fog and fire that's coming off the booster? That's hot. Literally. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean it, it is a beautiful vehicle and um in the same way that I'm sad that everything in the armed forces is trending it's like it's gonna all be F thirty fives, it's like no more cool planes in the near future it's like a lot of the rockets are kind of coalescing around sameness so it will be a little bit sad to see delta four heavy go away but at least we get one final hurrah yes hopefully during the daylight because most of the uh delta four heavy launches out of the cape tend to occur either at dawn at sunset or at most of them in the middle of the night i mean you had parker solar probe Um, oh that was an awesome mission that was amazing uh i Still can't forget. Oh, I hate saying it. NRL 44. Oh, oh, that hurts. Oh, it hurts. Is that, is that the one that scrubbed a million times? Yeah. It, it scrubbed at T minus uh, seven seconds on one attempt. So the engines lit. So they had to replace all the engines. And then it scrubbed like five more times. Yeah, I think it was its seventh, sixth or seventh attempt that it finally went off. All of these at like two, three in the morning. Ugh. Yeah. But yeah, it made that. it that much more glorious when it finally did launch. Mm-hmm. 
Indeed. I, it is a beautiful I mean, rocket. And, I mean, come on. It yeah. sets itself on fire <clears throat> as it launches. Yep. Like, how, how can you not love that? The most metal yeah. of rockets. It is. It is. It's, it's pretty awesome. If you're wondering why that big fireball comes out at uh, the bottom, it's because the RS-68As, those three big engines that are at the bottom, uh, the RS-68As use an open fuel cycle. So they have a hydrogen turbo pump and an oxygen turbo pump, and those have gas generator dumps out each side. So when you go, when this rocket goes to fire off, you're sp- for a momentary second, you're spraying out gaseous hydrogen and gaseous oxygen. They mixed, and, and that's what the igniters, those sparklers are there for, the radial outward firing igniters. Those aren't ROFIs technically, but they call them that. Right by ULA's own admission, uh, and so they they purge off that hydrogen cloud, the the, the gaseous hydrogen that well they're called hazardous gases. They purge off the hazard the has gas, and that makes that big fireball. Now I know what people are thinking they're like well, with that big fireball going up, doesn't that damage the vehicle? Yeah, you're only using it once; it's not a big deal. There are other vehicles where that have sparklers where you really wouldn't want flames traveling up the side. Uh, the, the shuttle also had sparkers like that, but the shuttle's engines were closed cycle. It's a fuel-rich stage combustion, which is a, it's different uh, because you're not getting copious amounts of has gas getting ejected from the vehicle at ignition. Um, but you know, I, I thought I thought you know the fireball is awesome, uh, but I thought you know it'd be interesting here to talk about L70 and you know talk about just Delta in general. The interesting thing is, I remember reading about Delta back in Popular Mechanics, and th- this was like 25 years ago or something. It, I read a Popular Mechanics at the freaking like school library oh. or something. And what are you gonna do? Yeah, hey, and, hey, hey, hey! I also liked Popular Mechanics and Popular Science. Get out of here, Sawyer. Right, older <laughs> than EJM. No, well, by you like a there. month or something. Like, come on, you can't do that. I just did so. <laughs> so Delta was made as part of the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program, or EELV for short. And the, the EELV program, which was ran by a guy named John Insprucker or something, you know, you might know him. He's a pretty normal dude. Uh, Spruck? He, yeah, he was, it was an Air Force program. And the interesting thing about Delta is that Delta and, well, Atlas Three were in the 90s built anticipating a crazy expanding satellite market. You know, people were launching more stuff into space. We launched so much, so much stuff into space in the in the early to mid '90s, right? And these rockets were built for fast integration. They represent a point in time where the demand, the anticipated demand, was going to go through the roof. And I always, I always see Delta systems and how they move the boosters around and how they integrate and put this thing together, and then you know, tow it to the pad on a really super cool like SPMT that's specialized especially built for for delta and how the thing gets actually put together vertically and vertically integrating the payload and stuff and and i think it's cool to understand that this this atlas so atlas Atlas three and then later atlas five you know the vehicles that were built for elv these rockets were built anticipating a market that never happened you know and it it's kind of like I kind of, I kind of can't help but feel like kind of down in the dumps about it, right? Because it was built like the shuttle. The shuttle was built to, and you know, anticipate a mark, huge market growth because now you you're getting 25 metric tons to space every every week, right? Delta and Atlas were built with that type of integration in mind, and you know, Sawyer, you talked a little bit earlier about how leaving the pad out for long periods of time, you know, yeah, you don't buy, you don't launch it a lot. Your pad's gonna have problems because you're not using it all the time. It's just like anything in aerospace. You leave it outside for a long period of time. It's not good for it, right? The interesting thing to me is that Delta and Atlas were built to fly missions, like Falcon Nine, not Falcon Nine iteration of flight nowadays. Like maybe like once or twice a month, right? And the ground service equipment for these vehicles kind of shows. You know, there. I think that's a really cool thing to to understand. Like, you know, why Delta is the way that it is now, because it, it was built for a very high amount of expendable launches, right? And it's important to understand that these vehicles were supposed to be like Falcon Nines of the '90s. You know, Delta Two, Atlas Five, Delta Four. I mean, they, these Delta Atlas Five, Delta Four didn't come on until the 2000s, right? But these were the Falcon 9s of their time. And it's interesting to me to see the torch being passed, you know, 
you, the evolved expendable launch vehicle program got tossed and national security space launches were replaced it. And the NSSL contract specifically, specifically talked about reusability. You know, you, Falcon 9 is an NSSL rocket, so is Vulcan, right? And Atlas can do NSSL missions too, right? And in even New Glenn, New Glenn is certified for NSSL, if I'm remembering right. I could be misremembering. There's a lot, there's a lot floating around up here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. So I think, you know, we could get bummed out about Delta, but it's, I, I think it's cool to learn its place in history and learn why it was made the way that it was. Now, you know, I said it was built for a lot of launches, right? This thing was built to launch all the time. You could just tell by how the ground service equipment looks. To get, uh, looks Like if you look at Slick 37 or Jack, if you look at Slick 6, this, I mean, Slick 6 is a converted shuttle pad, but Slick 37, 37B has like three integration hangers all next to each other because they were anticipating just sending this thing out, mass production and everything, kind of the stuff that Falcon 9 ended up doing a little bit later, right? But it never happened because the dot-com bubble burst and the launch market dried up overnight in 1997. That's part of the reason why Delta scrubs a lot. That's part of the reason why, you know, we don't see that thing launch very much. And, you know, it, it it's bittersweet seeing Delta launch for the last time, but it's also, it's also important to understand that, you know, Delta four crawled. So rockets like Falcon nine and rockets like new Glenn could run. You know what I mean? Right. It, it's, right. it's important it's to understand this place. It's history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing yeah. to note is there was a whole Delta four family. So it wasn't like it, they were relying solely yep. on Delta four heavy. Uh, mm -hmm. You had the Delta four, Medium, yeah, medium. medium plus, or five four plus with the different variants, with all yep. the different solid rocket motors, I believe, on that, on yeah, the medium. The ironic, exactly. The uh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, yeah, dude. The the irony is that Atlas and Delta were designed to compete against each other in a commercial market, right? Mm -hmm. They were supposed to compete against each other, and because the launch market basically went belly up in the '90s because the dot com bubble burst, because tech companies wanted to launch satellites into space, the the demand for it went. <laughs> It went to nothing. It went to nothing. And that's, it's important to understand that that's part of the reason why ULA exists. But, you know, when SpaceX came on the scene in the early 20, you know, late 2000s, right, early 2010s, you know, SpaceX was basically founded because Elon looked at how we launch things into space and he said, nope, I don't like this. I'm going to do it myself. Right. He's doing okay. He's, he's doing, he's doing okay. You know, but part of that, that place in history is understanding where we are today because of that perspective. I think it's super interesting. And I think that's much better of a send off for Delta than just being like, I mean, it's the last launch, you know? Right. And I mean, Absolutely. this was, this was like the original, the OG Falcon heavy in a way of you wanted yep. a really big heavy lift vehicle, three cores that can uh, yeet things into geostationary orbit. I mean, that's pretty much what you got here. It may take a couple of tries to get off the pad, but once it does, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful vehicle. It, it's, it is a, uh, I guess I'll say 14.5 out of 15 launches are successes. The first flight was considered a partial failure because they were delivered into a slightly lower than normal orbit because mm -hmm. of engines shutting down early on the uh, center and core stages. But after that, Everything went exactly as planned. And also, I love the fact that the first launch, they went, oh, no, this thing is going to blow up. It's setting itself on fire. And now they've just embraced the right. most metal of rockets. Yeah, that, the scorchiness on the very first Delta Heavy was uh, extra in a, in, a, in a fun way. <laughs> in a slightly concerning but fun <laughs> way. Um, but yeah, I, I, EJ, I don't really... I don't have really anything to add, man. You said you said it all better than I could. Um, Delta, Delta, and Atlas crawled or walked or whatever. So, so Falcon Nine and, and other new rockets could could mm -hmm. run. So, that's a good way to look at it. And uh, looking forward to seeing this beautiful vehicle fly one more time coming up here at the end of the month. Yes, please hope for a day launch. Indeed. Anonymous. We want some more, Thanks more for... amazing prints at shop.nasaspaceflight.com, like the ones that we have of the final Delta IV heavy flight that you saw earlier from Vandenberg. Indeed. Are those still subtle. up there? I know, the very subtle plug there. Yeah. No, good deal. Uh, Travis, thank you for the store purchase. They say, yes, I'm the bullet hole shooter. Finally picked up what I wanted to purchase. 
Excellent. Thank you, Travis. I love that he's given us an out for his name. And by us, I mean me. Yeah. Um, Blake Alexander, thank you for the support. They say, EJ, would you say we have a plethora of balloons? I, I do not get the reference. I'm assuming that's from the Twitch side. No. No. Jack, hold up your hat. Higher. Hold up. What? Higher. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Chad, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know. I don't know what you want. <laughs> uh, Blake Alexander, uh, we did that one. Um, thank you. Wait, no, it's another one. EJ, would you say we have a plethora of pinatas? Damn, I mistyped. I have no yes. idea what's going on. Yes. What is going yes. on? Yes, yes, Chad, you have a plethora. Uh, it's the Three Amigos? Wow, okay, it's been too long since I've seen that. Oh, it's such a good movie. I tried. Hey, I actually saw some, you know, some folks in chat saying, you know, like, Ari, like, why SpaceX was getting, you know, why SpaceX was founded. I mean, how detailed do you guys want to go? Like, I was trying to keep the, the explanation succinct, but I know the circumstances of how SpaceX became to be a thing. I mean, Elon flew to Russia, right? Flew to Russia, tried to get, tried to launch a greenhouse to Mars, and they told him to pound sand, and then he said, screw it, I'll do it myself, right? What I, that's why I said partially, right? What kind of, that, that, what I was talking about kind of came a little bit later. SpaceX did lobby the government in the early 20 teens, right? Towards being able to get into the evolved, the, the, the expendable, like, well, basically for defense contracts to get Falcon 9 certified for the defense, for the, launching Department of Defense payloads. That's more as to what I was referring to. Could I have used words better? Yeah, probably. Sorry, it's a little bit late. I do know the circumstances. I mean, it really depends on how crazy chat wants to get into detail here. I'll talk your ear off. Don't oh, he test will. me. He will. <laughs> I'll talk your ear <laughs> off, dudes. You know, but yeah, the, it, I understand the circumstances in which SpaceX was founded. But part of that, part of, you know, uh, SpaceX trying to figure out Falcon 9's place, go, pivoting from Falcon 9 to f from Falcon 1 to Falcon 9, is because of that, because of the Department of Defense contracts, and because the state of what evolved the expendable launch vehicles in the United States was at the time. But you didn't want to fly Falcon 5? Oof, no, no, I'm good, thanks. Which was a th it was a proposed thing. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Didn't they want to air launch that thing off off of the rock, if I'm remembering right? Falcon, it was just, Falcon 5 Air, something like yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, it was disgust. Yeah. In disgust, it was disgust. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gunfox, thank you for the $20 tip. They say, speaking of Starship, could SpaceX Dragon be used to dock with Starship if SLS does not work as NASA and SpaceX want it to? And a pun token for Sawyer. Yes. Yay! Absol I absolutely see a world where Dragon docks with Starship. 100%. Like, yeah. wh whether or not SLS and Orion, like, take that completely out of the picture. I mean, like, Polaris. Perfect example. Polaris Flight 3 or, or 2 or something I could see involving a Dragon and a Starship at the same time. Um, I'm, cool. Well, the, I think, I think yeah. that's basically about it for this week. I don't know, EJ, Almost. did you have something you wanted to you to uh, just uh, just already the question. <laughs> Do you want something you working on the novel? <laughs> just something. <laughs> I mean. Also, we got to uh, give Blake Alexander another shout out, Jack. Yeah. Oh my God! I see it. I was gonna do it. I will do it. Do it. I see it. I, Thank I'm you, gonna Blake. keep calling out on it. it. In, in, oh my God! Do it. do it. I was just gonna say that Dragon <laughs> and Starship are sh share share the same NDS derived design. Yeah, it's theoretically possible that they could dock with each other. It depends on the hardware installed on each Ow. one. But yes, you could. they're derived from the same docking port. Jake, Jake, hey, don't Jake, bite Jake me. is Jake Ow. is willing, uh, or I'm willing Jake to to bite you. If that was all me, I, I take full credit for that. Dang, Jack, not not cool. Jake, bad. Yeah, man. Maybe maybe watch yourself. Maybe check yourself before you uh, you wreck yourself there. No, he wants my he wants me off the air. That's what it is. Not nah, have He's no. like feed me. Yeah. Um, Get out of here. Seriously though, Blake Alexander, hundred dollar super chat. Thank you so much. That's outstanding. And you're also one of those people that pops up all the time with huge amounts of support. So thank you for this and for always. They say really love off the rails puns, Ow. filibusters, and especially movie literate 
hosts. Sorry, Trevor and Adrian. Please keep this going, fellas. Looking forward to Flight 4. You got it, buddy. Keep showing up. We'll keep doing it. We seriously appreciate the insane amount of support. $100 is so much money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Choo-choo. Has choo -choo. anyone kept track of the choo-choos? Like, I, I, we were keeping track at first there. I have no idea what our count is at this point. But all aboard the moon train! Choo-choo! All right. Um, thank you, Blake. Blake, thank Let's you very see. much. Let's see. Uh, Y'all, there was so much support on tonight's stream. We appreciate it. We, You know, it's always hard to do something new, uh, change formats and change things up. You don't know how it's going to be received, but it seems like y'all are really enjoying the new NSF Live format. So we, we thank you for it. We thank you for tuning in. Um, it's, it's really humbling to see everyone coming out with the huge amounts of support. And even if you can't support us monetarily, you know what? That's no big deal. It ain't, that ain't no thing because that is how this works here. We're a massive crowd-funded thing supported by viewers like you and you know what if you if you don't want to or can't support us monetarily that's what everyone else is doing so that you can get the content just the same speaking of launch directors and flight engineers the two highest levels of our membership program here on youtube thank you so much to all of our launch directors and all of our flight engineers y'all are the bedrock on which the entire structure of nsf rests so thank you thank you thank you thank you we hope you enjoy all of the sweet perks don't forget we're doing the pre-shows i think we might do a little bit of a post show too as part of nsf live so if you're in the member discord pop in and uh Check out the pre-shows before NSF Live. Check out the post-shows. Always trying to come up with some cool stuff for y'all to watch and enjoy. And just more content, more better. Am I right? Oh, so, yeah. 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 And don't forget to follow NASA Spaceflight on all the socials. You know, we've got NSF on Twitter. We've got NSF on Instagram. We've got NSF on the... Do we have a TikTok? I think we, we might do. even still have it. On, on Facebook. On all the places. So wherever you get your social media needs, uh, why did we get a ding ding? I don't. Because yes, that's no correct. Reason. We do. Nothing. He's saying yes, we do have the the TikToks. <clears throat> and oh, oh, yes, okay. there sure. is there is short form content on there too. Sawyer, thank you for being on this week as usual. My pleasure. Always a, a fun night with you guys. EJ, Something. thank you <laughs> as well, my my guy. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. It is a it's a privilege being on here, and I, I don't I don't take it lightly. Uh, yeah, it's always it's always a good time. Always a good time. Do you take it like uh, one sixth, uh, roughly? One sixthly, like yeah, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that that's All what's right. going on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks, both of you. Thank you to Jay, Ryan, and Tanner in the background helping us out with the Starbase views. And thank you to Kevin Michael Reed for running in the giant human-sized hamster wheel that powers everything. EJ, what's up? Jack, yeah, one last thing. Yeah, Kevin, you're the man with your, with your sound effects. Don't play when I got to talk real quick. Guys, I just want to say, sometimes, you know, we're gonna, we have to discuss bad news with space. But remember, for every bit of bad news that we get, we get a plethora of good news. And that's why we're see here. What you did there. And that's what that's what uh... we do. Okay? So you gotta take the good with the bad. There's way more good than bad, so don't get down in the dumps about this, all right? It'll get Because better. that's what we do and that's what we care about. Uh, I'm trying to do a Tommy boy there. I mean, anyway. <laughs> our parts for the American working man because that's what I am and that's who I care about. The American spacefaring man, because that's what I am and that's who I care. Alright, anyways, y'all. You're the best. This is always so fun to do these. So thank you for tuning in. We love you. You're the best. EJ Sawyer, you're the best. Kevin, you're no, awful. You. I'm kidding. Kevin, you're, you're the, best. the best. All right. No, you're breathtaking. Uh, I'm, well, I am. I'm breathing. I'm like literally taking a breath right now. <gasps> All right. Let's end it. Let's end it before it gets worse. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you guys. Oh, God. Here come the gifts. Oh, no. I oh, this is the best. Gifts. Shout out to the people downstairs that make these, I guess. <laughs> it's like all EJ this out. week. I'd like to give a shout out to me. I did that face <laughs> intentionally figuring that would be gift, I gotta say. <laughs> quality, quality face palm, Sawyer. Quality stuff. That's yeah, the that only one good. that was planned, though. The rest of them, I don't know.
<laughs> it looks like I'm frozen, but the fan in the background <laughs> is, it, like betrays that fact. That's that's, that's Jack's beekeeping face. Oh, oh why does my face look so fat? Do I have a fat bra. face? I think I have a fat face. No, it's stripes. They're not thinning. You're a zebra. <laughs> Wait, did the image just change? Wait, what? what? Don't make me look at my face. Come on, I hate it. Move on. Uh, no, no, keep doing it. Chop, Kevin, chop. Keep... And here we go. Pressure looks good. All right now.